forget that you can always hear more on the From Our Own Correspondent podcast. That was the BBC programme from our own correspondent. Well, good morning, Manitoba, and welcome to a new month, April 1st. Uh, maybe you are still off today for the long weekend. I hope you had a nice Easter if you celebrate. Thanks for joining us here on Information Radio. This is your morning show. I'm Marcy Marcusa, as mentioned, and you're on CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app, and on YouTube also this morning. So thanks for joining us. Let's have a look at what's going on in the weather just to start your uh, Monday morning here. A high of 5 today. It's going to be mainly sunny. And this week we really take a turn where we're going to see some double-digit highs. Uh, daytime highs by the end of the week, uh, maybe even midweek. This morning we're sitting at minus 5 in Winnipeg. The warm spot in the province is Victoria Beach at minus 3. The cold spot is Churchill at minus 21 degrees. Over in Brandon it's minus 7. And up in Thompson this morning, good morning to you. It's partly cloudy and it is minus 12. We're on air right till 8.37 a.m. If you have any issues on the drive, the walk, the roll, on the commute, give us a call. 788-3093. The person answering those calls will be Dylan Longhurst. Morning, Dylan. Dylan's also behind our technical controls today. And also good morning to Brad Lillies, who's behind the YouTube controls. Heather Wells is also in. It's two minutes to six. And you know what I'm going to say. She's here with headlines. Hi there. Good morning. Well, you may notice the price at the pumps is higher this morning. You're not seeing things. It's early, but it really is about three cents a litre more to buy gas. It's all part of the carbon tax. The national price on pollution rises today. Day. Uh, you will also pay more to heat homes, fill barbecue tanks. Uh, but in Manitoba, Premier Wab Canoe says he is going to present Manitoba's case that Manitoba should be exempt from the carbon tax. We'll hear more from him coming up. As well, Winnipeg's Muslim community had a busy weekend wrapping gifts for people who need them most. It was the seventh annual toy drive of the Manitoba Islamic Association. We'll hear more in our next news at 6.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, tomorrow is budget day in this province. And actually, our program this morning is going to tee up a whole bunch of things that we are expecting we'll hear more about. Uh, First, First of all, uh, the carbon tax. So this morning on the program, uh, we're going to look at that. We're going to hear about what Premier Wab Kanu said after he was elected. We're also going to hear from uh, Eric Rader from the Wilderness and Water Campaign Wilderness Committee in Manitoba, who says that uh, hold your nose, but it's necessary. We'll hear uh, his arguments in favor of the carbon tax. Uh, in addition, we're going to talk about heat pumps. Should you get one? Today on Q. I'm Talia Schlanger sitting in for Tom Power. The last time Cheryl Crow was on the show, she said she was probably done making records. She'll tell you how thinking about the dangers of artificial intelligence motivated her to get back into the studio making new music. So much I don't know, so I Q. This morning at 10, 10.30 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. Despite protests from some premiers, the national price on carbon is rising. It happens every April 1st. That means people across most of the country will likely see a price bump at the pump. But federal carbon rebates will also increase in provinces that receive them. As David Thurton reports, not many Canadians know they get that money back. You're, you're a resident of Ontario, right? Yeah. And you're not sure if you got the rebate? No, no. On the streets of Ottawa, questions about the federal carbon tax and the money some get back. The national carbon price rises today. What about yourself? Do you think you're getting more back? No. You think you're losing money? Yeah. The price on carbon rises from $65 per ton to $80 at the pump. That increase means some will pay about an extra three cents a litre. Adults receive federal rebates, which researchers say for many exceed the carbon tax paid. And as the price rises, so does the rebates. Sarah Hastings-Simon is a professor at the University of Calgary. She studies low carbon energy transitions, including carbon pricing. We know that the vast majority of Canadians are actually getting back more than they pay. So uh, for those that are seeing those direct deposits come, I know a lot of people don't get checks in the mail anymore. They just kind of end up in your bank account. Um, you will see that that amount go up. Um, and I think sometimes there's some confusion as well. You, you get this payment quarterly. So Payments arrive every three months. The next one is expected in as early as two weeks. 
Rural residents could soon see a 20% top-up on their rebates since many living in small towns tend to drive more. Their homes also use more energy. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Israel says its military operation at Gaza's biggest hospital is over. Images and video of Al-Shifa Hospital show rooms burned out. Entire buildings in the complex are rubble. The Israel Defense Force says the facility in Gaza was being used as a Hamas base. Israel's prime minister says more than 200 terrorists were killed. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says dozens of bodies were found in and around the hospital. Turkish voters have delivered a major blow to President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Local elections were held yesterday, and the country's main opposition party swept some key cities, including Istanbul and Ankara. It is the worst electoral loss Erdogan's party has suffered in more than two decades. Freelance reporter Dorian Jones has more. Supporters of the main opposition, Republican People's Party, celebrated victories across the country. This supporter, Jale Chanel, says she's looking to a brighter future. I have hopes for the new era. I expect the future to be good for retirees, for young people, for children, for women. The opposition won control of most of Turkey's main cities, dealing Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan his worst electoral defeat. Erdogan led the campaign to retake Istanbul, but was resoundingly defeated by incumbent Ekrem Imamoglu. Addressing thousands of supporters, Imamoglu, widely tipped as a future presidential candidate, said a blow against Erdogan's authoritarian rule has been dealt. The period of one-man rule is over as of today. It is done. The republic and democracy is going full speed ahead from now on. Near 70% inflation and interest rates of 50% are seen as the main factors behind the Turkish president's resounding defeat. Erdogan, addressing supporters in Ankara, said they would learn the lessons of the vote and move on. But that will be difficult with a resurgent opposition. Dorian Jones, CBC News, Istanbul. South Korea's president is promising to push forward with a plan to increase medical school admissions. There is strong pushback from doctors in his country. Yun Suk-yeol says he needs medical schools to allow an extra 2,000 people in each year. South Korea has a shortage of doctors to help treat an aging society, but interns and medical residents have been protesting the move for the past six weeks. They have forced hundreds of surgeries and treatments to be canceled. They say schools cannot handle the abrupt addition of that many new students, and doctors will not get the training they need. A Montreal couple's experience is revealing how costly a safety recall can be for consumers. They were told their truck had a defect that could lead to a sudden loss of power. But for nearly two years, the car maker had no permanent fix and the couple had nowhere to turn. They took their story to Rosa Marcatelli and our Go Public team. It may result in an unexpected loss of motive power, which can cause a vehicle to crash without problem. Michelle Ashenden got that urgent recall notice for their 2016 Dodge Ram 1500 way back in June 2022. Almost two years later, she was still waiting for a permanent fix. We never thought in a million years we'd be waiting this long. Her husband, Vittorio Polcini, says the truck was too dangerous to drive. It will just randomly shut off while driving, 100% completely black. The couple got the truck towed to their local dealership. Meantime, they racked up thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs for rental vehicles and more. Transport Canada estimates one in five vehicles has an unresolved safety recall. It's not clear how many of those are because automakers don't have a fix. Giorgini is from the Automobile Protection Association. Transport Canada should be able to hold the manufacturer accountable. Transport Canada tells Go Public they don't set deadlines for recalls so automakers can control the process to ensure vehicle safety. Stellantis manufactures and sells Ram trucks. It says this particular recall needed redesigned fuel system components and more. 
After Go Public inquiries, the automaker said it will look at reimbursing the couple for their out of pocket costs. So, money out of pocket, mistreated. A permanent fix became available a month ago, too late for the couple. They traded the truck in at a different dealership. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Wildlife rescuers on Vancouver Island are keeping an eye on the tides. They're hoping the water will work with them to help free an orphaned orca trapped in a lagoon. They had to coax the two-year-old whale over a sandbar and out into the open ocean. Its mother died more than a week ago. She beached at the lagoon. The low tide forced rescuers to pause their efforts over the weekend. In one week, millions of people are expected to look up for a rare celestial event, a total solar eclipse. They've been around for, well, as long as there has been a moon, but an eclipse still presents a rare opportunity to research the natural world. Science reporter Anand Ram has more. Zebra's hooves crunch through the snow, part of a quiet afternoon at the Granby Zoo, east of Montreal. But on April 8th, the animals here will be under close watch to see how they react to a total solar eclipse. Our Japanese macaques are probably going to go a little bit crazy. Chelsea Paquette is a conservation coordinator at the zoo. We think that they might vocalize, uh, huddle in the group together. They might actually look at the, the sun or lack thereof. Captive subjects are one thing, but other researchers are studying animals out in the wild, as many depend on the sun for navigation. Cecilia Nielsen is a researcher at Lund University in Sweden. Light is such a ubiquitous cue that really like goes through everything. She studied bird and insect movement during a previous eclipse in 2017, finding a drop in animal activity. Her theory? They were probably interpreting it more as like a gathering storm or something like that because it's like slowly getting darker and then for a short period it's very dark. Insects, which react quicker to changes in light, might be confused. Dazeen Huber is with the University of Northern British Columbia. I would expect that some uh, insects like honeybees might have some trouble navigating briefly. But when the sun comes back a few short minutes later, researchers say these animals have inbuilt mechanisms to reorient themselves and get on with their day. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. LeBron James is not slowing down. He will turn 40 in December. But last night, James put up 40 points to help the L.A. Lakers to a 116-104 win over the Brooklyn Nets. It is a significant achievement for James. He's just the second NBA player to score 40 points in more than one NBA game after his 39th birthday. Michael Jordan is the only other player to achieve that feat, and he did it three times before he retired. Tired at 40 because 40 is not old. 40 is very young. <laughs> that is the latest national and international news from World Report. I'm a very young Marcia Young. <laughs> That was funny. Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcy Marcusa. This is Information Radio. We are live in downtown Winnipeg on this Easter Monday morning. If you're still off, enjoy the day. Because we have sunshine coming. But uh, spring break behind us, and there is school in today. So thanks for joining us. This hour on the program. Coming up this month in April, McCreary. April 20th and 21st is going to be having their Maple Syrup Festival this hour, though, we're going to hear how Canada's Maple Syrup Reserve has hit a 16-year low. We're going to find out why, and we're going to ask what 24, uh, the 2024 sap season is looking like. In addition, on the heels of the uh, eve, I should say, of the budget coming out tomorrow in this province, we're going to have some discussions throughout the program today about things that we are waiting to hear about in the budget, including housing. Could the Salvation Army on Winnipeg's Main Street become part of a permanent housing solution being eyed in Manitoba? We're going to revisit a conversation we had there about that and the populations that they serve. So that's coming up this hour as well. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells for other things making news. Good morning. Good morning. Winnipeg police are asking for your help finding a missing four-year-old girl. Sadie Jane Forbes is believed to be with her mother. She and her mom were last seen at the McDonald's on Henderson and Fraser's Grove around 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Police believe they have since left the province and are heading west in Saskatchewan. And police say they are highly concerned 
for the little girl's well-being. So we'll hear more about that. You may notice gasoline prices are higher this morning, up more than three cents a liter. This is the morning many Canadians start paying more for the price of pollution. The carbon tax kicks in every April 1st. It is something Manitoba's Premier wants this province to be exempt from. We'll hear from Wab Canoe in our next local news at 6.30. So Heather Wells, let me be the first to make the joke about April 1st. And it's no joke about the gas going up. It is no joke. But um, bump. That's all I've got this morning. <laughs> Did you have a nice Easter? It was so lovely. Yeah. Oh, good. Beautiful. Good, good. Well, the How about we- you? Uh, you know what? It was also lovely. Yeah. My mom, honestly, my mom, I can't believe she still puts on the whole spread. You know, she does the Pasca. Her and dad make a dinner. Like, it's just, yeah, really nice. So That's beautiful. I'm grateful for that. And way too much chocolate. So there's some out in the newsroom if you want. No, no, I know. I put it there. <laughs> I add it to the pile, I think. Maybe I forgot to take it out of my bag. But <laughs> All right, let's see what's going to be going on this week in the weather, and then we'll turn our attention to the commute. Uh, weather-wise, mainly sunny today, a high of 5 degrees. A little bit windy today. Winds will be south 20 to 40. Into tonight, increasing cloud. Chance of rain showers late this evening, and then a low of minus 1. Uh, so back to school this morning, uh, back after spring break week, and it's going to be warm uh, as we get through this week. Marching through Tuesday, cloud cover, a high of 5. Wednesday, we could see 6. By Thursday, it could be 9. By uh, Pardon me, by Wednesday, 9. By Thursday, we could see 11. So we could be getting into those double-digit daytime highs. So we'll see what develops. But today in Winnipeg, lots of sunshine and a high of 5. Uh, current temperatures right now, mainly clear in the city. It's minus 6 degrees. In Brandon, it's mostly cloudy. It's minus 7. And up in Thompson right now, it's mostly cloudy as well. And it is minus 11. Now, as I mentioned, school's in, so there will be some traffic to cover. Dylan Longhurst is here to talk commute. Yeah, we'll be seeing how that picks up as the show goes on. But right now, it's all quiet out there on the commute. So enjoy it. If you're out there on the roads, you get to maybe have a little extra hour of some quiet driving. But if you do see something out there, you can, of course, always let us know what you're seeing and say and call us. It's been a long weekend. I'm nice and relaxed. (laughs) I'm still waking up here. You can give us a call, 204-788-3093. It is expected to be a big part of tomorrow's provincial budget in this province. But beyond the funding, what is the reality for the people who are unhoused in our city? Last month, we met a number of those people in a special broadcast. We were live at the Salvation Army Centre of Hope on Main Street. Now, the building is part of a three-block stretch of Winnipeg where many people land when they're looking for some help. Now, whether that's help with housing, with food, with addictions, or with hope. In other cities, the Salvation Army is involved in permanent housing. Mark Stewart is the executive director in Winnipeg, and he weighed in on that and more during our live remote in March. Good morning. You know, we got here at five this morning. There were people outside the door. Is it always like that? Uh, Yeah, 24 hours a day we're open. Our front doors are open, so we have staff at the front desk, and which means that at any time throughout the night, if you're coming from uh, uh, this community, other communities um, that were open, our doors open, and we want to welcome you in. Uh, unfortunately, we're we're getting quite full right now. We, we're seeing just over 420 people a day, so it's getting a little bit less comfortable uh, in our building. The more beds that we add, but uh, we don't want to turn anybody anybody away. What's the longest someone actually stays here? Because it's not just about emergency response, right? There's a mm-hmm. range. So the ranges for emergency shelter is usually around three months. And then for a transitional shelter, it's up to two years. What's it like for you to look out the window? We're on the second floor here in a health office. But I mean, it, it, there's people out right now at the door. There's a makeshift sort of a place where people have uh, set up kind of an encampment for themselves as we were driving up Austin here. Um, what's it like for you to see, as I mentioned, you know, the need sort of spilling out into Winnipeg? Is, it's just so difficult to keep up. A lot of it is is point of view. I I see, Hmm. you know, I see these things, but I also see the positive things that have happened over the last, uh, you know, 18 years that I've been involved with the Salvation Army. Um, You know, Nadine Waymack, uh, you know, a shelter that's just on the street, which is helping people. Um, Mama Way, which has a a village here that's been created over the last year, um, last couple of years, which is housing people. The Thunderbird House, which is... um, 
you know, it doesn't look its best right now, but, you know, is the heart of this community, you know. So I know that uh, working with the other organizations within the community, everybody has a heart for this work. Everyone is, everyone wants to see um, chronic homelessness end, right? And that's why we're looking at more long-term housing. But, you know, the stigma of the people that are in front of our building right now, they're they're the people that live here. They're they're good people. It's astounding uh, the resilience that, that people actually um, show that are homeless. Do you see a, a future where the Salvation Army could get involved in longer term uh, housing, like longer stay housing? Because you were telling me off that the Salvation Army is involved in that in some other provinces. So beyond the two years that you have right now? Um, well, we, we would love to be a part of long term housing. So we know that uh, housing is, is a big part of the answer. Um, deep affordable housing, uh, which is 30% of, uh, you know, the income would be going towards rent. We know that that's needed in the community. We want to be a part of that. Uh, we have a small piece of that, which is a 13, uh, 13 unit, um, you know, floor where we have women that are living long term. So, um, we're kind of testing the waters with it to see what it would look like. I think that the model that we're looking at is a little bit different. We don't want to supervise people. We want to support people. And we find that a lot of people that live within our building and some of the stories that you've heard, they need support, but they don't need 24 hour support. So, you know, how can we look at doing something long term where where uh, people can just actually live and, and, you know, be successful? You were in the news because of the refugee story, right? Uh, talking about the number of, you know, being part of the response to to helping asylum seekers, refugees, people coming here. And I think you opened 60 beds even last year uh, to sort of try to meet that need. What do you hear about why um, Winnipeg, uh, where people are landing here? Um, I think that there there might be a myth, and I'm not sure if it's true, that if you come to Winnipeg, you're going to get services faster, you're going to get your claims faster. I don't know if that's true, but uh, for our part of it, uh, we're seeing about 120 refugees a day. A and, day? Uh, a day. So wow. that would be yep. static numbers. So yep. some people are coming, some people are leaving, but the number is, is sticking around 120, um, you know, Again, if you're from this community, if you're from another community and you show up at the door, whether it's uh, by yourself or with your children, uh, our door is going to be open so that we can try to support you and, and uh, help you get back in the community in a safe space. Now, you coordinate right now with uh, some of the other agencies to try mm -hmm. to help. Uh, you're involved, I understand, even trying to, with even some of its translation services and some of it's just uh, figuring out what that support looks like. How sustainable is it all, though? Well, it's not sustainable. I think that, uh, you know, we do need... Uh, I think the the shelter systems uh, definitely don't want to speak on behalf of all of us, but you know we're stressed. Um, I think that you know when we're adding more beds, we're talking about adding mats on the floor with blankets to try to keep people comfortable and keep people in from the cold. But um, you know to actually provide dignity to the people that we're serving, I think that we need to look at different solutions. And that solutions at the end of the day always looks at long term housing. We need to build more long term housing. We need to be a part of the the solution uh, uh, on ending chronic uh, homelessness within our community. And, you know, it's um, it's a battle every day. Uh, we didn't even touch this morning yet on the fact that you have some mental health residential care here as well. How many beds here? Um, so we have an 18-bed mental health facility, which is uh, called Haven. And we've been operating that a very long time. So um, what I would say is that's the gold standard of, of care that we provide. Um, so they have mental health workers, they have daily facilitations, they have uh, uh, up to two year stays, so they have all of the services connected to them. Um, for the most part, the guys are, are level five mental health, but there's other scenarios as well. And a lot of those guys that live in that program have come from emergency shelters. So you come into emergency shelter, you meet with our caseworkers, and what we want to do is find out what the best solution for you is, right? Uh, you and I were at a breakfast uh, last year. We ran into each other, and, and you said two things to me that stayed with me, and they were both busting myths. One was... Hey, Marcy, did you know the average age of the person that stays here at the Salvation Army Center of Hope is, I think you said, a male, 55 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then you said uh, what we've heard repeatedly this morning is that the stigma that everyone is struggling, and some are, but that everyone is struggling with some type of a drug addiction. Yeah, and, and we recognize that there, there's um, 
a drug epidemic in, in Winnipeg, and it's happening, and, and you can't deny it. Um, uh, primarily within our shelter, you know, we do have people that use drugs, and, and if that's the way that they want to live their life, that's a harm reduction principle-based model is what we use. So we want to support you in, in whatever lifestyle you're living, but primarily within our building, we do see an older population uh, who are looking for safety and the safety that we can provide with our private rooms uh, makes us a makes us kind of a, a choice for them. Just last, I mean, you're the first executive director of this organization, the Salvation Army, who has lived experience with homelessness. Uh, you at one point in your life lived in your car. You shared with me. Um, I wonder with respect to, and this is said with respect, the hardworking leaders and the politicians who are trying to help the city's most vulnerable. But given all of your perspective, what do you understand that they might not when they're sitting down to make the plans to help these populations? Well, uh, being a lived experience leader, you know, uh, I have to thank the Salvation Army for that, for giving me an opportunity to, um, you know, to grow uh, with this organization. Um, the thing that you need to understand, which is very difficult to understand, is um, that true feeling of hopelessness and loss when you have no choice. Right when you have when you've run out of, of options and when you don't have a dollar, you have nobody to call. Uh, where the only thing you have is to sleep in your car, or sleep outside, or try to get into a shelter. You know the 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 marginalized, the more marginalized and vulnerable you become, the less choices and options you have in life. So when we are talking about building and growing, um, we need to include lived experience people because they should have a choice in what they're what we're trying to create for them. That is Mark Stewart, Executive Director of Winnipeg Salvation Army Centre at the Centre of Hope. Now, we were there live last month on location for the show and for that conversation, but it will tee up a number of conversations that we're actually going to revisit this morning because we are getting ready for tomorrow's provincial budget in Manitoba. Housing expected to factor uh, into the budget. We'll see specifically what the province is going to come up with by way of uh, moving forward uh, and meeting the needs of Manitobans. So what do you hope's in that budget when it comes to housing. You can call us at any point this Monday morning. 788-3205 is our listener line. And just a note here, we will be live tomorrow. We have plans to have up to speed live at the uh, legislature building. So that is uh, tomorrow for the provincial budget tomorrow afternoon. So of course, up to speed on air here on 89.3 from 3 to 6. All over Turtle Island, host Rosanna Deerchild welcomes you to Unreserved. Indigenous peoples are retelling history through an Indigenous lens. Unreserved, celebrating 10 years, looking back at how far we've come and looking forward to the journey ahead. How do we keep the story going? Unreserved with Rosanna Deerchild. Now at a new time, Sunday afternoon at 2, 2.30 in Newfoundland, 3 Pacific, 4 Mountain, and on demand on CBC Listen. Mainly clear in Winnipeg this Monday morning, first day of April, minus 6 is the temperature. It will be sunny today with a high of minus 5. Over in Brandon, sunny and a high of 3 today. A little bit breezy, winds will be southwest 20 to 40. You'll have um, a little bit of cloud that could creep in this afternoon in Brandon as well. And in Thompson, mainly cloudy actually today and a high of 1 degree. And the uh, flurry uh, will move in a good chance of some flurries in Thompson tonight, as well as uh, a chance of increasing cloud and flurries or even rain tonight in Winnipeg, which will be good because we are dealing with uh, what could be really a terrible drought, drought situation heading into this spring. So we're going to need all of that moisture that we can get because we didn't get it through snow, certainly not here in Winnipeg. We just heard Mark Stewart in that conversation, if you were uh, with us, uh, talking from the Salvation Army about how they are uh, meeting the needs of an increasing number of uh, refugees who are coming to uh, their facility on Main Street, to their organization. Uh, we have music, actually, that sort of looks at one of the stories. Uh, the Town Heroes first wrote this song in response to the civil war in Syria some years ago, and they found the themes of longing for peace and dreaming of a better future uh, still ring true today. So this morning we thought we'd give you a little music from the Town Heroes out of Halifax. This is Dry Land on CBC. <laughs> Help 
helps me get away from the war. right the town heroes you can check out the townheroes.com for their upcoming shows of the for the year they uh, hail out of halifax that tune in case you uh, wanted to get it onto your own uh, onto your own device here and onto your own playlist it's called dry land time right now is 6 29 a.m i'm marcy marcusa thanks for joining us here on easter monday speaking of which why is it called easter monday what are the actual roots of that so when you look at uh, how this day was created it's not a day off for all schools in for example a lot of people at work but some people are off so why We'll uh, talk about that and answer that question after your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg, and it is April 1st, and we're warming up. That's no joke either. Uh, Sunny today, a high of 5. Right now in Winnipeg, we're at minus 6. Winnipeg police are asking for your help finding a missing four-year-old girl. Sadie Jane Forbes is believed to be with her mother. She and 28-year-old Shasta Forbes were last seen at the McDonald's on Henderson and Fraser's Grove around 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Police believe they have since left the province and are heading west in Saskatchewan. Sadie Jane is described as 3 feet 6 inches tall, 36 pounds with brown hair. Uh, eyes and uh, long, straight brown hair. She also has a small birthmark on her right cheek. Police say they are highly concerned for her well-being. If you've seen the little girl or her mom, or if you have any information about where they are, you are asked to get in touch with police. 
Well, you may notice gas prices are higher this morning, up slightly more than three cents a liter. This is the morning many Canadians start paying more for the price of pollution. The carbon tax is imposed every April 1st on provinces without a carbon pricing plan of their own. And it comes just one day before Manitoba's provincial budget. A budget premier, Wab Canoe, says has many green incentives and will show why Manitoba should be exempt from the carbon tax. In terms of electrifying uh, transportation and converting to, to, to ground source heat pumps for homes and businesses and these other incentives that we're putting into place, Manitoba has a really credible path to net zero and uh, we don't think that the backstop is needed when it comes to that consumer carbon tax. B.C., Quebec and the Northwest Territories have their own plans and are not part of the tax or the rebates. Canoe says his government plans to make a case to Ottawa soon. Nearly 700 of Winnipeg's most vulnerable people will be served Easter lunch today. Salome Mission will host the sit-down holiday meal starting at noon today until 2 this afternoon. Dozens of volunteers and staff are preparing and will serve what is one of the downtown shelter's busiest meals of the year. A Winnipeg woman who lives with a chronic disease hopes a new nonprofit will help other people like her get the medical care they need. Emma Cloney has lipedema. The disease causes painful fat buildup and swelling in the arms and legs. But she says Canada has no standard of care for treating the disease. She says it can be difficult for people to get provincial health coverage to pay for surgeries needed to remove it. Cloney struggled to get her own surgeries covered by the province. While I knew that joining Lipedema Canada wasn't going to change my situation personally in any way, um, I also knew that People like my daughter have lipedema, my mother has lipedema, and I've now met thousands of people across the country who are suffering without services. And I just felt so emboldened that we could do better. Cloney is now the vice president of Lipedema Canada, which has just launched its brand new website today. Winnipeg's Muslim community had a busy weekend wrapping gifts for the people who need them most. It was the seventh annual toy drive of the Manitoba Islamic Association. The toys will be given to families in need, including those who are new to Canada. Ten-year-old Youssef Shavan came to the event with her sister and her cousin. I brought a puzzle and a game called uh, Mouse Claps. They brought a puzzle and dolls so I can help people in need have um, gifts for Eid. The donated toys will be distributed by the Canadian Muslim Women's Institute along with some hampers for Eid. Some high school students in the Lakeshore School Division are getting in touch with nature and history. The land-based program started about a year ago, incorporating elements of Indigenous knowledge and culture. Nahani Shorting is in grade 11 at Ashern Central School. She's from Little Saskatchewan First Nation and has just been certified as a trapper. She and her peers recently learned how to skin coyotes that were donated by a local trapper. And Shorting says she can see herself as a land-based coordinator one day. Maybe I'd first take the step to help my community out know, then I have multiple cousins and I would teach them. It's probably what my dad would want anyways to carry on the legacy and the knowledge of what I know about hunting and providing for your family at a young age. Lakeshore officials say nearly half of the students in their school division are Indigenous. And Canada's youngest territory turns 25 today. Nunavut was born April 1st, 1999. That's when it officially separated from the Northwest Territory, changing the map of Canada forever. PJ Akiagok is Premier of Nunavut. I think we're at the point where we've really had 25 years to look back upon uh, the foundations we've built. Uh, but I think we've matured over the course and I uh, am confident that we'll continue to grow as a, as a territory as other jurisdictions have had. Nunavut covers one-fifth of Canada's landmass. You can hear more national and international news coming up on World Report at 7. And you can find more Manitoba news at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. All right. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. It's time for your regional forecast from CBC Manitoba. And it looks sunny uh, in Winnipeg, at least. Sunshine, a high of 5 degrees. And that's today into tonight. Cloud cover. Could see some rain or flurries tonight in Winnipeg. And the winds will pick up a little, south 20 to 40. The low minus. 
minus 1. Tomorrow, mainly cloudy in a high of 5 degrees. And then uh, in uh, the rest of the week, it's looking like we just get warmer and warmer. Wednesday, sunshine 9. Thursday, sunny, high, a high of 11. Friday in Winnipeg, sunny and a high of 13, if that holds. So that'll be nice. Lots of melting, and we need the moisture. So the rain in between will be helpful. Minus 6 right now in the city of Winnipeg. It is mainly clear, and you can see that nice sky just with that beautiful telltale shade of blue for this time of morning. Let's check uh, around the regions. Brandon, sunny today as well with a high of 3 degrees. Winds will be southwest 20 to 40. Uh, with wind chill, though, factored in, it could feel like minus 21 this morning. So still bundle up. Uh, tonight, clearing, low minus 3. Tomorrow, sunshine in Brandon, a high of 3 degrees. And then that holds for uh, Wednesday as well with sunshine. Thursday, 6. Friday, 9. So warmer through the week in the west as well. Right now in Brandon, mostly cloudy, minus 7. And finally, up in Thompson, uh, right now you're sitting at minus 11 degrees. It's mostly cloudy. And uh, for the day, it's going to stay cloudy for you, a high of one degree. And then tonight, chance of flurries for you as well. Good chance, a low of minus eight. Tomorrow in Thompson, cloudy and a high of five degrees above. And then on Wednesday, seven, Thursday, eight, Friday, nine, sunshine all week long. So that's for northern Manitoba as well, or at least for Thompson. And right now, as mentioned, you're sitting at minus 11. Back here in Winnipeg, though, minus six with that clear sky. And I suspect a quiet commute, Dylan. Yeah, so far very quiet. I mean, the the schools being in today will, of course, make things a little bit busier for some parents, I would imagine. But right now, we're kind of sitting without much uh, much going on out there on the roads. And I want to mention, in terms of that weather, I mean, it's not much solace this morning. It's still a little bit chilly, you know, bundle up and whatnot. But if you're going out this morning and you're coming back later today, it's going to be in those positive temperatures with sunshine. And this is just the start for the week, and it gets warmer every day. So, I mean... This is a great week if you're going to be an active commuter, if you're out there on a bike or you're waiting for a bus. Agreed. Can't, I, I'm looking forward to that so much in the near future. I think it's the, the turning week almost, right? Yeah, it really feels like it. I mean, we always say that here in uh, in Manitoba, <laughs> and then we get an April snowstorm. So, you know. Stop! <laughs> Turn your mic off! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I got I to gotta be a little bit realistic. But, yeah, yes, this happen. week going into that, like, real spring temperature yeah. is going to be nice if you're getting out there on a bike. So, I might want to consider that uh, as a change this week if you want to. Otherwise, if you see anything out there, of course, always let us know what you're seeing on the roads. 204-788-3093. All right. Thanks a lot, Dylan. I live with a golfer, so we're always keenly aware that uh, of when the turning week happens. Uh, business news. We don't have our full report this morning from Crystal Lee Ramlikan, as it is Easter Monday. Still a holiday for some. Uh, but I will point you to cbc.ca slash news slash business for the top uh, headlines and the opening numbers around the world. Uh, they've got a couple really interesting stories this morning there. One of them is about a group of Tim Horton. Horton's franchi- franchisees in Quebec, and they have sued Tim Horton, saying they didn't make enough money, and they're blaming the brand. So you can read more about that, and you can also read more about how companies are using test kitchens to try new products, uh, especially in the fast food market. So A and W specifically cited in this article. You can check out numbers and more business stories there. Well, as I mentioned, it is uh, today known by many as Easter Monday. So the bunnies are mostly gone, and the eggs are mostly collected, but Why is it still a holiday for some people, but then not for everyone? CBC's Blair Sanderson headed out on a hunt of his own looking for the answer and for the meaning of Easter Monday. For some Canadians, shopping for good deals on chocolate is the most prominent ritual performed on Easter Monday. But what is the religious significance of the day? Surely it's pretty important. Many government employees even get the day off. Going to the church? But far away from the discount candy aisles, the pews are empty at St. Agnes Church. You can hear the echo as Father Paul Morris explains how the weekend plays out. So Good Friday, yeah, it's all about the cross. And Easter Sunday, it's all about the resurrection, the empty tomb. Monday, not too much in the Latin Catholic tradition. In fact, you can count Father Morris as one of the lucky Canadians that doesn't have to work today. But why, then, is it called Easter Monday? What's the connection to the resurrection? So, um, Blair, how would you like a cup of coffee? I'd love one, thank you. All right. Reverend Kevin Little suggests we settle in for a little chat to get the answer. He's minister at Bethany United Church. The Easter story is the central story of Christian faith, right? So Easter Monday is the 
first day, if, you, if you've had a kind of renewal, if, if your faith has been sort of kick-started and you're sort of saying, well, maybe I'll, you know, this is something I want to give some attention to, it's the first day to test it out. So one of the things I always hope for as a minister, are Christians actively discerning, looking for Jesus beside them? Reverend Little says this is why Easter Monday deserves to be a holiday. In other parts of the world, the day is marked with more enthusiasm. In some Eastern European countries, Easter Monday is known as Wet Monday. The name of the actual holiday is Schmigus Dingus. Schmigus Dingus. Schmigus means getting, you know, it's, it's, it's a wet, wet ritual. Arthur Sekula is from Poland, where boys dump buckets of water on girls as part of the Easter Monday tradition. There's a whole industry related to, to Wet Monday. For example, a week or two weeks before, you start buying all the equipment needed. Uh, we actually have uh, little Easter eggs which, were, which are squishable and they, 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 you know, they spray water, right? The origins of the practice are not clear. Some speculate the water is related to the baptism ritual, while others say it developed as a pagan practice long before the arrival of Christianity and was simply absorbed into the whole Easter season. Father Paul Morris says that word is appropriate. Easter is a season, not just a day. So Easter is 50 days, which goes from Easter Sunday until Pentecost Sunday. In this way, it's similar to Christmas, where the temptation is for us to look at Christmas as one day, December 25th. But also in the Christian tradition, Christmas is a whole season. And both Father Morris and Reverend Little say that's why it makes sense Canada's holiday structure has evolved into having this extra Monday off. After all, Christmas gets two holidays, so maybe think of today as Easter's Boxing Day. Except the good deals are mostly chocolate related. For CBC Radio, I'm Blair Sanderson. Hi, I'm Paul Haverschrude, host of The Cost of Living a national business show that looks at everything the world of money touches, which, admittedly, is a lot of stuff. The Cost of Living. Go beyond the facts and figures and discover the compelling business stories that affect the day-to-day -day lives of Canadians right across the country. Economics, business, and you. The Cost of Living with host Paul Haverschrude. Available now on CBC Listen. 6.44 a.m. on Easter Monday. I'm Marcy Marcusa. Thanks for joining us here on the show. You're with Information Radio on CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 a.m. On the app and on YouTube this morning if you're up early. And maybe you are because the kids have school today. So uh, maybe you're getting them out the door. A nice clear sky out there for that in Winnipeg. Minus 6 is the temperature. And Dylan Longhurst and Brad Lilly's behind the glass this morning. Well, next on the show, let's take a little bit of a musical trip outside of the perimeter, shall we? Many small towns have certain historical spaces that are seen as treasures. And in Verdon, Manitoba, the Odd Theatre, in the heart of the quaint downtown, is exactly that. But the community there had to come together to save it. Michelle Chizik is the artistic director of Verdon Theatre Productions, and Dean Munchinski is the co-director and actor. And they put the house lights up and set up the piano to give me a full appreciation of the grand old theatre space when CBC visited last fall. It's not every day that I get to take the stage, but I'm going to take this one because you would not believe the magnificence of this beautiful theatre. My guests with me today, uh, Michelle, hi. Hello there. And Dean, hi. Hello. How old is the Odd? The Odd was built in 1912. Um, there was a councillor and uh, editor of the newspaper, Jack McLaughlin, and it was his idea to build the theatre. It seats 500 people, and the town at the time was 1,500 people. So it was completed in 1912. Uh, they did numerous, uh, they had vaudeville shows, they had different troops that came through, uh, big bands that came through. And then in the 20s, it was changed to a movie theater when the uh, talkies came through. So it ran like that until the 40s. Uh, in the 60s, it was shut down and it was abandoned. And the, there are windows above the, above the stage. Okay, where um, we're standing now. Yeah, where okay. we're And they were broken. There are pigeons flying through here. The so plaster. It fell in disrepair. Yeah, disrepair, complete disrepair. So the plaster was falling down. Uh, it was uh, open to the weather. And uh, 
they called for it to be torn down in the 1980s, early so, 80s. So it, it's not only still standing, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but it's standing magnificently. This theater really looks like you've walked back in time. The gold on the sides, uh, the balconies on either side, with uh, the, the classic red curtains just draped. You can imagine someone sitting up there with spectacles in 1911, maybe yeah, looking the down. The two guys from the Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the guys from the Muppets. <laughs> now replaced by what? Two grumpy people yeah, from yeah, Verdon? Yeah, yeah, cantankerous <laughs> geezers from Verdon. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, it's it's gorgeous in here. W- was the goal to restore it? Obviously, you were at the point where it was falling into disrepair. How did it come to be restored to this magnitude? Well, when they looked at... Um, at, at, at what the building was, how it was built, um, they brought in some experts who said, what do you think about this? And they said, this is the finest opera house um, in the West. And so they started a committee, to Save the Odd Committee. They raised $80,000. It's been a work of love. Now, just for the sake of the radio audience, the Odd is A-U-D as an A-D. auditorium. Yes. So you have brought a lot of uh, students, I understand, Michelle, to this stage What an amazing stage for a young person to be on. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I've just retired as a teacher after 35 years, and I was lucky enough to teach K-12 to music. So the neatest part about our town is that um, magically our five-year-olds get a chance to stand under these footlights and take the stage. And so we end up with people that feel very comfortable in this place and have a lot of performing skills. But we also have uh, bands that come through, professional bands that come through and play, and they are shocked when they walk through the doors because this is just not something you expect in Ferdin. We are um, working towards uh, having it used more often. More often in what way? Like Yeah, so uh, we currently are working on um, on the seating. The seating that we have here is uh, is from 1911 and <laughs> and it's uh, we we happen to be different sizes than we were back in 1911. Let's go test. Okay, we can't. Come on. Let's go. What are you saying? Are you saying my butt's not going to fit in this well, seat? It can be a bit of a challenge. <laughs> oh yeah, we are we are cheek to cheek. We are cheek to cheek. <laughs> so now all three of us are sitting down in the front row uh, in these uh, in these seats, and they're like red covered with the original wood around them. So I can't believe from this perspective how much originality is here. The, the, is that mural up there original? Yeah. We have to yeah. bring that down. Oh, bring down. This is spectacular. This mural is going to move like a curtain. It's coming down. Now this is magical. This is a beautiful original canvas curtain. I don't know if you can hear it coming down so gently. It's the original curtain, and it was restored um, when they saved the odd. They restored this lovely curtain by two local artists, re- hand-painted it. On that flat canvas that slides up and down. Yes. I'm, I'm going to guess that that's going to be uh, 36 feet across. This theater reminds me a little bit of the Burt in Winnipeg. Very much. Okay, let's so, head on back upstage here, onto the stage. So there's a bit of a display here that you guys have got laid out. This is just a few pictures from some of these large productions. We make magical sets. In this one, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. We're looking at a book here on stage here just to capture it. What size was that pharaoh's head, Dean? Uh, It was eight foot by eight foot. Uh, You're industrious out here in West Mountain. Yes, indeed. (laughs) Uh, Local artist uh, George Baker uh, he he created this. He sculpted it and painted it. That's Dean himself there playing the Is that you? <laughs> you look fabulous. I was wandering like a- along on the banks of the river. Yeah. So are all the people that are in these large productions, Matilda, Mamma Mia, you mentioned Joseph. How do you cast them? Like, where's everyone from? This year, our production has performers from Saskatchewan, Merrifield, um, Cola, Elkhorn, Verdon, Minnedosa, Brandon, Souris, Oak Lake. But people come from all over. We all are just dearly in love with this building and the sense of camaraderie, the, the way we feel and the pride we have for our projects um, is overwhelming. People don't often leave. Once they come, they stay. <laughs> well, let's entice people to come if they haven't visited yet. We're going to end with the tune, I think. And she sang me out of Verdon. 
uh, Michelle Chizik and Dean Munchinski. Uh, this tune, of course, from The Music Man, sung on stage to me at the Odd last fall in Verdon when CBC was there. By the way, if you're looking to check out The Odd now, a production of Aladdin just wrapped up. And next month at The Odd, Verdon Collegiate Institute's going to be putting on Newsies Junior. Check out their Facebook page if you're going to take a drive from Winnipeg. It is nine minutes to seven o'clock now. And in Winnipeg, it's minus six. Lots of clear sky out there. And it is the month of April. That means a couple things. First of all, some festivals coming up. The Sugaring Off Festival in St. Pierre. McCreary's going to have the Maple Syrup Festival. But our next interview is all about why those festivals... uh, will be very special this year because there's not a lot of maple syrup. The reserve, the only one in the world in this country, has reached its lowest level in 16 years. Now that's because of a combination of factors my next guest is going to talk about, including warmer weather and increased demand, both at home and around the world. Alain Bryson is a maple syrup producer and owner of Eau Maple, a business in Notre-Dame-de-la-Merci in Quebec. Good morning. Good morning. So how concerning is this, this reserve, the, uh, you know, the lowest level in 16 years? Can you put that in some context for us? Oh, for sure. It's, uh, it's, I have to say that before this uh, maple season, it was somewhat alarming because we want to try to uh, maintain uh, product to continue the development of the market and make sure that no one misses any maple syrup, for sure, Canada especially. And, um, it was getting to a low enough point that it was uh, of some concern. Um, have you seen it like this before in your time uh, working working in this area? Um, yeah, back in 2007-2008, uh, uh, the uh, basically world stocks uh, dropped to uh, essentially nothing uh, lower than the point that we were at now, and and unfortunately that had a, a negative impact on uh, the development of our product and and um, price wise uh, the price of course once uh, it doubled at that time it became. Uh, difficult for different consumers to be able to purchase the product still and that's something that we want to avoid we'd, we'd much prefer to have a stable price and uh, product available at all times can you elaborate a little bit alan about um you, you know i mentioned the warmer weather and demand at home and around the world can you elaborate on the factors that are that have put us in this position oh for sure uh, so it's it's twofold it's definitely uh, the uh the extreme uh, weather patterns that we we seem to be experiencing uh, more and more. So either uh, uh, too hot or, or cold, or um, also uh, during the summer sometimes we have higher winds, uh, drought, uh, more rain than expected. So these uh, situations seem to be more and more frequent, and it and it definitely has an impact on uh, our production capacity. And what does it do? Can you talk about how your season's been affected this year, like literally when you're out there trying to chop the trees? Yeah, so, um, you know, fortunately this year if uh, we're having a, a decent season, so we should be able to put some, some syrup back in the reserve, which is, a, which is good news. But um, if I use the example of last year, we had uh, actually very cold weather up until the beginning of April, and then middle of April it got extremely hot. And when it gets too hot, for too long, then the, the trees basically shut down and there's no more uh, uh, sap production, which we then uh, convert into maple syrup. So the trees are very, very dependent on uh, on these uh, weather patterns. And what we hope to get is a gradual uh, thaw over time with uh, still uh, obtaining uh, frost in the, in the evenings and, and um, for a period of six to eight weeks. And when we get that, then we have a seem to have a better production. Uh, for people that, I mean, I probably should have asked this right off the top, I apologize, but for people that, so a lot of people might not even realize that we have a maple syrup reserve. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that and, uh, you know, how it's created and, and what it's there for? Yeah, so it, it's been uh, over 20 years now that we've had the uh, reserve in place. I think it's actually getting closer to 30 years. And uh, it was put in place in order to be able to uh, stock uh, syrup when we had larger production years and to be able to go into that reserve to uh, release some of the uh, stock so that uh, we wouldn't be without any uh, maple syrup. So you're speaking about your uh, your maple festivals that are going on uh, in a short period of time. Well, if, if we had run out of uh, maple syrup, then there potentially there wouldn't be any of those kind of festivals going on and happen all across the country. So it's really important that we do have some on reserve at all times, and uh, it allows to make sh- it allows to uh, make sure that we have a supply for uh, the consumer. 
Speaking of the consumer, I mentioned global demand is up. Uh, where, where's that coming from? Or actually overall, where's the biggest demand coming from when you look outside of Canada? Yeah, so uh, outside of Canada, we export uh, around 90% of the product that's made. And uh, the large uh, buyer is uh, the United States by far. And then it's followed uh, by Europe, Japan, Australia, UK, some of the key areas. But it's being exported more and more now all the time. And uh, there's there's different countries that are exploring the product. Uh, as of recent, India looked into it. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's multiple countries, but... Um, Definitely, those are the big four or five. And, and is there also an uh, an increased interest in maple syrup um, as a substitute for sugar? Oh, definitely. I mean, there, one of the nice things about and it's it's just an overall trend is is the health aspect. And I know we're talking about if there's actually the, if you're going to use sugar, let's try and use some healthy sugars. So uh, maple syrup definitely fits into uh, that category and and. Um, as we go uh, on and on, and there's more research done, there's more and more interesting, interesting things that are that are coming out of it, and I think that the consumer is more and more aware of that. The fact that we're able to use it in in multiple uh, facets as well, uh, in cooking, in beverages, and uh, salad dressings, and you name it, it's uh, it's a uh, multi uh, facet uh, product, which uh, I think has helped increase the demand. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. Appreciate you outlining uh, what is uh, a challenge and something you're concerned about. Appreciate your time. Okay, thank you very much. Have a nice day. You as well. That's uh, Alan Bryson, maple syrup producer and owner of O Maple, a farm in Notre Dame de la Merci, Quebec. Uh, the Sugaring Off Festival, as I mentioned here in Manitoba, looking at our producers in St. Pierre, is scheduled for next weekend. So it's April 6th and 7th. And then McCreary, the maple syrup festival, is coming up this month as well, April 20th and 21st. So, of course, the discussion not about this season, which, as Alan said, has looked pretty good uh, weather wise in terms of maple syrup production, but the reserve uh, at a 16 year low. Let's go to Heather Wells now with other headlines. Good morning. Good morning. April 1st, the day the carbon tax adds about three cents a litre to the price at the pumps for most Canadians. The carbon tax is meant to encourage you to burn less fossil fuels and switch to greener forms of energy. Premier Wab Canoe says he is taking on the challenge to find an alternative to the federal carbon tax. Manitoba's budget will be released tomorrow, and Canoe says it includes incentives to help solve the climate, climate crisis. Nearly 700 of Winnipeg's most vulnerable people will be served Easter lunch today. Salom Mission will host the sit-down holiday meal. It all gets going at noon today and runs until 2 o'clock this afternoon. You can find more Manitoba news at cbc.ca slash Manitoba and your next local news coming up at 7.30. Thanks, Heather. You're welcome. We're going to touch base with Salome actually live later in the program. Minus 6 right now in the city, mainly clear sky and dry streets if you're driving the kids to uh, school today. Uh, it is very quiet on the commute though 788-3093 if you need to reach us with anything urgent well Heather mentioned today's the day Ottawa has raised the carbon tax we're going to hear from a climate change activist in Manitoba who says the tax has been politicized but it's a proven way to go green also you might have started some spring cleaning this long weekend but if you have an old piano sitting in the corner of your house good luck finding it a new home that story is coming up And to serious matters, the overdose crisis is killing thousands of Canadians every year. Manitoba's new NDP government has confirmed it wants to establish a supervised consumption site. We may get details in the budget. Stay tuned. We'll talk about it. Today on The Current. She says it is a miracle the city tank has water. And without it, the whole neighborhood would suffer. Mexico City's 22 million residents are having trouble getting access to water and in three months they may reach day zero where the water will run out. How the world is struggling with drought coming up on The Current. The Current with Matt Galloway this morning at 837, 907 in Newfoundland and on the CBC Listen app. This is World Report. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young. Humanitarian morning, groups in Gaza Young. and beyond Humanitarian- are reacting to reports Israel has put forward a plan to dismantle UNRWA. It is the biggest relief agency operating in the Palestinian territories, but Israel alleges some of its employees have ties to Hamas. Dominic Valaitis has the details. 
According to the Guardian newspaper, Israel's proposal to dismantle UNRWA was presented to the UN last week. Under its terms, three to four hundred of the agency's staff would initially be transferred to another UN agency like the World Food Programme or to an entirely new organisation specially created to distribute food aid in Gaza. According to the newspaper, more UNRWA employees would then be transferred at a later date, along with the agency's assets. Israel has claimed as many as 30 of the agency's employees took part in the October 7th attacks. It still hasn't offered any evidence to support that claim, but the allegation initially led to several countries, including Canada, withdrawing financial support for UNRWA. With famine looming in Gaza, Ottawa and others have restored that funding. But Israel's reported proposal to dismantle the agency has generated alarm in several quarters. The UN's humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, says no other agency has the same reach, experience or trust in Gaza to distribute aid there, and that any effort to do so without UNRWA is doomed to fail. Dominic Valaitis, CBC News, London. The national price on pollution rises by $15 per tonne today. The carbon tax applies to more than 20 different fuel sources, including gasoline, propane, diesel, and natural gas. That means people filling up in affected provinces can expect to pay roughly three cents more per litre. But there will also be a boost to the Canada carbon rebate. The federal government sends that to eligible Canadians every three months. In Turkey... Thousands of people celebrate on the streets of Istanbul. Local elections delivered a major upset to President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. The country's main opposition party held on to power in key cities, including Istanbul and Ankara. It also made gains in areas that were considered strongholds of Erdogan's party. Erdogan told his supporters in Ankara these were not the hoped-for results. He says his party will analyze the message sent by voters. This is the worst electoral defeat his party has seen after more than two decades in power. There's a lot at stake as the U.S. House of Representatives gets set to resume business next week. Republican Mike Johnson's position as Speaker of the House is under threat. And a new funding package for Ukraine could divide both sides of the floor. The CBC's Richard Madden joins me now from Washington. And Richard, let's start with Johnson and a motion to vacate the speakership. Uh, What can you tell us about that? His speakership was threatened last week by a far-right member of his own party, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Now, she officially filed a motion to oust him after the House passed a $12 billion spending bill to keep the government open. Now, Greene says she was furious about the price tag and how he compromised with Democrats to cut a deal. And keep in mind, Johnson presides with a razor-thin majority, and it would only take a handful of Republicans to vote him out. So his speaker's gavel could all hinge on the next divisive issue— funding for Ukraine in its war against Russia. Take a listen to Nebraska Republican Don Bacon, who was blunt on the prospects during an interview on NBC. It's possible. I'm not going to deny it. We have one or two people that are not team, they're not team players. But it is very likely that after this Ukraine bill, uh, we may have a standoff with the speaker. I hope the speaker prevails. Uh, He's doing the right thing. It's in our national security interest that Ukraine remain independent. Now, Green has yet to put the motion on the floor, but it sets up another unprecedented scenario. A relatively new House Speaker would be the second Speaker to be booted in the same Congress and the same party. So what are the chances he could be ousted? Yeah, allies of the Speaker don't think Green will follow through on her threat, and even if she does, they don't think she has the votes. Now, in an interview yesterday, Speaker called her threat a distraction, but he's clearly aware Ukraine is a divisive issue, and funding is at odds with some on the far right of his party. So he's reportedly working the phones to ensure his survival. All right, thank you, Richard. Thank you. The CBC's Richard Madden in Washington. As of today, German adults can legally smoke cannabis. This is what it sounded like as the clock struck midnight at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. Dozens of people gathered there to legally smoke marijuana for the first time. 
Germans older than 18 are allowed to carry up to 25 grams of dried cannabis, and they can grow as many as three plants at home, but it is still illegal to smoke it within 100 meters of a school, playground, or sports center. A popular independent bookstore in Hong Kong is now permanently closed. It is the latest store to shut down over government pressure and fears of censorship. Freelance reporter Laura Westbrook has that story. As the Mount Zero bookstore switched off its lights for the last time, Hong Kongers took photos to document the moment. Located at the end of a quiet alley, it was one of the city's most well-known independent bookstores. On social media, it said it was closing after receiving a series of warnings from government departments for minor violations. The store was also known for hosting book talks, and a sign posted above the doorway read, Ideas are bulletproof. Among those gathered was Joyce. I think what's so unique about the bookstore was that it created a physical space for people from the neighbourhood, for people who love reading, who loves Hong Kong culture, to meet and exchange ideas um, over the past few years, which is not so common for Hong Kong. The handful of independent bookstores in the city have cited a challenging environment following the Beijing-imposed national security law in 2020. And now there is a new domestic security law that critics say could further chill artistic freedom. But authorities reject those accusations. As the bookstore shut its doors, the U.S. says it would be taking steps to impose visa restrictions on some Hong Kong officials it deemed responsible for the intensifying crackdown on rights and freedoms. The Hong Kong government called the curbs a despicable political move, while Beijing said Washington should stop interfering in its internal affairs. Laura Westbrook for CBC News, Hong Kong. Twenty years ago today, Gmail was unveiled to the world. Google's co-founders launched the free email service on April 1, 2004. It offered users one gigabyte of storage for each account. That was at least 250 times more storage than what was being offered by other services. At the time, people thought it was an April Fool's joke. But users and industry insiders quickly called it a breakthrough. But today is an even more significant anniversary for Inuit. 25 years ago, Nunavut became a territory. Now people are looking forward to what the next 25 years may bring. The CBC's Juanita Taylor has more. It was a cold, frigid night when fireworks rang in Nunavut on April 1st, 1999. People gathered in Iqaluit to witness history being made, including then-Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, there to sign the proclamation alongside Nunavut's first Premier, Paul Ukalek. We, the people of Nunavut, have regained control of our destiny and will now once again determine our own path. Nunavut, which means our land in Inuktitut, covers one-fifth of Canada's landmass and has now been self-governing for the last 25 years in areas such as education, justice and health. Nunavut Premier PJ Akero. I think we've matured over the course and I... I am confident that we'll continue to grow as a, as a territory. As Including others. taking the reins over managing lands and resources. And there's challenges like tackling the territory's housing shortage crisis and growing the Inuit workforce in Nunavut's government. Eva Makba is a student at Nunavut Arctic College. She has big expectations for her territory. I wish Nunavut would have more housing and also have more resources for mental health in smaller communities. Governor General Mary Simon and her husband Witt are in Nunavut this week to mark the occasion. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Rankin Inlet, Nunavut. As preparations begin for tonight's big party, here's a song from Terry Uyarok. It's called Inuit Nananga. And that is World Report. I'm Marcia Young. Good morning, Manitoba. I'm Marcy Marcusa with our team here at Information Radio. This is CBC's Morning Show live in downtown Winnipeg on 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app, on YouTube, wherever you need to find us on this Monday morning. 
Well, spring breaks behind you, and of course, the nicer weather is ahead of us. So uh, we are looking at a pretty warm week. We'll get into the forecast in a moment. Right now in Winnipeg, it is minus 6 downtown with a nice clear sky. Well, the other thing that's on the table this week is going to be Manitoba's provincial budget. And this hour on the show, we're going to revisit some conversations we had about things that we expect are in the budget. So let's start with the NDP expecting to have details about supervised consumption sites. But what should a supervised drug consumption site look like in the city? How should it work? Some insight from someone working on the front lines of drug addiction coming up. Also, you might have started some spring cleaning this long weekend, but good luck getting rid of an old piano if you've got one. We have an encore presentation of a really lovely audio story, but if you love pianos, It'll hurt to hear this one just a little bit, uh, so stay tuned. That's coming up at 7.40. Right now, uh, back to uh, political news and other news. Heather Wells is in with our headlines. Good morning. Well, you're going to notice gas prices are higher this morning, uh, slightly more than three cents higher than they were yesterday. Uh, this is the morning many Canadians start paying more for the price of pollution. The carbon tax is imposed on provinces without a carbon pricing plan of their own. It comes just a day before Manitoba's provincial budget. A budget Premier Rob Canoe says has many green incentives and will show why Manitoba should be exempt from the carbon tax. So we'll hear more from Wab Canoe coming up. As well, Winnipeg police say they are highly concerned for the well-being of a missing four year year old girl. Sadie Jane Forbes is believed to be with her mother. They were last seen at the McDonald's on Henderson and Fraser's Grove around 3.30 yesterday afternoon. I'll be back with more Manitoba news at 7.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Well, let's get into what's going on uh, in the weather uh, here. I mentioned minus six in Winnipeg, also minus six in Brandon, minus 10 up in Thompson. It's mostly cloudy in Brandon and Thompson. It's clear here in Winnipeg and we're going to be sunny today and a high of five. So spring's sunshine and a high of five is going to feel really warm this afternoon. So you can look forward to that, especially if you happen to have the day off. And uh, let's get into what's going on on what's so far been a quiet commute, Dylan. Yeah, it's been very quiet. Phone hasn't rung and we haven't heard of any other major problem spots getting people's way this morning. I mean, people heading to school today, you might notice some traffic around there over the next little while. But otherwise, it's been pretty quiet. So here's hoping stays the same way for the rest of Easter Monday show. Uh, but if you do see something out there getting in your way, stalls, collisions, just, you know, big pothole, flock of geese, let us know. Give us a call, 204-788-3093. Dylan says I should make a correction. Are we correcting the geese thing? You should correct it. Yeah, this came up a little while ago. It's gaggle of geese if they're walking, but okay. flock if they're flying. It's actually different. Oh. So I okay. love the word gaggle, gaggle of geese. Let <laughs> us know if you see any out there getting in your the way of your commute. Yesterday, there were just two on the median. I was looking at them. They were standing. Look like they were having a conversation. I always love those caption this photos. So yeah, lots of geese out and about. Such a hopeful and yet messy sign of spring, right? Well, as Heather mentioned, uh, today is the day where you're going to notice the carbon tax increase already on some of the uh, fuel pumps around town. Uh, it takes effect across the country, or it's taken effect, I should say. Here in Manitoba, as you did hear in the news, the Premier says he's looking for an alternative. In fact, it was one of the first things he brought up after being elected last fall. Specifically, Wab Canoe said that he wants the government, federal government to remove the carbon tax from natural gas home heating as a start, is what he said at the time. Now, we're revisiting that moment uh, and followed by an interview we had with Eric Rader this morning of the Wilderness Committee. He says the carbon tax has been politicized, but as I mentioned, he also says it's a proven way to go green. First, here's just a bit of the Premier in November. I think that uh, it's important for us who want to take action on climate change to remember that the, the, the basic idea of getting broad public support for action on climate change means bringing the working person along, means bringing the middle class family along. And so as part of a long-term strategy to combat climate change, we also need to show flexibility and help people who are struggling right now because of inflation. It's clear that the, the carbon tax is not a silver bullet. Instead, we need a comprehensive suite of actions which are going to move the needle on home heating and transportation and in different uh, sectors of our economy. And all of that should be done in an approach that makes sure that people can still make ends meet month, month to month 
and ensure that they have the resources necessary to 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 make a the climate friendly uh, decision once it's uh, within their reach. Eric Rader is with us. He's a wilderness and water campaigner for the Wilderness Committee, and he asks, what would cutting the carbon tax cost Canada's climate? And he's with us now. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for being on. So what's your reaction to what Premier Canoe has put forward here? Uh, well, it's better than the first quote I heard that he just said we needed to axe the carbon tax. Um, the two really important points are that uh, the carbon tax isn't a silver bullet. It is a tiny piece of uh, changing the way that we do virtually everything. I mean, climate affects all things that everybody does. Uh, so we have to work on that. And the whole suite of pieces that need to be put in place so that everybody gets brought along into a zero carbon economy, that's the place where I think we need to be focusing right now. Um, w- why not ax the carbon tax? Uh, the progressive uh, nature of the carbon tax, it's a, it's a process that's used in other places for other taxes. In Canada, unfortunately, it's been rapidly politicized as this horrible thing. And the reality is that people down the road uh, are making better decisions about the fact that they know it's going to be much more costly to use these vehicles. Maybe you're replacing three vehicles at work, but in five years' time, you know, if you buy these big ones that are going to be costly uh, or use much more fuel and be more carbon intensive, it's going to cost you a lot more. So you're making the decision to get uh, a smaller vehicle. That's one example, Um, putting extra insulation into your buildings. That's one example. And of course, uh, furnaces, that's the thing that started this all off. And what we need to see is uh, programs that get us off of fossil fuels. And once we get off of fossil fuels, Everybody stops paying the carbon tax. That's the whole point of the tax. But does it have to go first? So let's revisit uh, not what the provincial NDP said, uh, Eric, but what the uh, federal NDP have put forward. Before the news, we were hearing about their proposal. They also have come forward and said, they. I think the Jagmeet Singh uh, was saying something to the effect of, he usually doesn't uh, go support a motion that federal conservatives uh, put forward, but there he was standing supporting it. Because he's saying um, that another plan, another way forward could be calling for the GST to be removed from home heating, to your point, expand programs for heat pumps and other environmentally friendly home improvements to low and middle income families. And as you know, our provincial NDP government has promised that as well. 5,000 heat pumps here was their promise. Um, The federal NDP are proposing they would pay for all of this with a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. So the parliamentary budget officer looked at what that would mean. It was an estimated that tax would bring in $4.2 billion over the next five years. So that's that's Jagmeet Singh and the federal NDP's proposal. What are your thoughts on that as an alternative to a carbon tax? Absolutely. The carbon tax, uh, that climate action is going to happen for the rest of your life, and it's going to become progressively more expensive to fight climate change every single year you're alive. It doesn't matter if you're 16 listening to this radio show or 70. It's going to happen for the rest of your life. We're going to have to fix this. So if we uh, stop getting cringy when we hear the word carbon tax and say, yeah, let's work on this uh, collectively, we need to get off our fossil fuel furnaces. So the plan that, and you know, we've worked on this in Manitoba for years, there's a climate action team that put together a document called the road to resilience and we talk about zero interest loans to get uh, your natural gas your fossil gas furnace out of your house and replace it with heat pumps and geothermal and your uh, hydro bill because again the manitoba hydro Mm -hmm. is a public utility your bill will stay the same you'll have got this new furnace on a zero-interest loan, and in 11 years, everything will be paid off, and suddenly your bills will start going down. But in those 11 years, you've already taken a huge step on climate action. In, in my case, uh, insulating, putting more insulation on the outside of my house so that my heat bill comes down for the natural gas I do have to burn. These are um, programs that we have to see. This is the way we bring everybody, uh, low-income, middle-income earners, we bring everybody's buildings, which is one-third of the emissions in Manitoba, up. And we uh, we change that aspect of it, but we don't keep harping away that the carbon tax is a bad thing. We need the climate action, and that's one little piece of it. And again, the carbon tax was put forward because uh, there was lots of opposition to acting on climate. We've had lots of disinformation from fossil fuel companies for decades. We're seeing this all over the world, lawsuits. 
we've been led down a path here that climate action is not something that we really need. But uh, way back when Premier Pallister uh, killed the first carbon tax in Manitoba, um, we had already heard from around the world that this is one of the best ways to bring a whole bunch of people in on climate action. This is one of the best, we won an economic prize, uh, the carbon tax scheme. So we're going to hear people yell and scream about having to act on climate while we're having rainstorms in November. I mean, there's a disconnect, and we've been given, we've been fed this disconnect for years by the fossil fuel industry. But we all kind of need to be the adults in the room and say, yeah, this isn't right, this isn't normal, and we're going to fix it, and it's, it's going to be hard, and it's going to be costly. And if we have the means to fix it because we make more money than our neighbors, then we're going to have to chip in. That's what taxes do, and, and you know, that's just where we're going to go, and there's no way that we can fight Mother Nature on that. Eric Rader is a wilderness and water campaigner for the Wilderness Committee here in Manitoba. Now, that conversation was last fall, right after the NDP were elected. Today, as you've been hearing in the news, that carbon tax has gone up. Tomorrow, we're going to see what the Manitoba government's going to spend on climate action initiatives when they table their first budget since taking office last fall. And when they do that, CBC will be live. Up to Speed's going to be live at the ledge tomorrow afternoon. More on what Premier Wab Canoe has to say about the carbon tax today, coming up in your local news at 7.30. Frequencies with Errol Nazareth. The world is alive with sound, whether across the street or across the pond, from back home or in your own backyard. Every place has a sound and every person has a story. Discover songs and stories from people and communities across Canada and around the world. Frequencies with host Errol Nazareth. Episodes available on demand on the CBC Listen app. 7.22 7.22 a.m. is the time right now. Minus 6 is the temperature in a nice clear sky downtown. Well, as you've been hearing on World Report, Nunavut became a territory 25 years ago. And this week, uh, they're going to be having celebrations up in Nunavut uh, of all different kinds. Uh, if you go to cbc.ca slash kids news, so CBC Kids, they have put together something cool. Uh, it is Fun 5 Facts about that. So number one, Nunavut covers one-fifth of Canada. It's the largest of the Canadian territories. And the second fact is, Iqaluit got its first traffic light in 2018. So just in 2018. And apparently it didn't last. Iqaluit didn't have any traffic lights before that. And according to our coverage, CBC News coverage at the time, that first light was May 2018. There was construction on Federal Road that was started. So it was only temporary to create a safer area around construction. And then it changed. Fact number three, Nunavut has three official languages. Can you name them? Giving you a second if you're at home. Uh, English, French, and Inuktitut. So now that I say them aloud, you're going, oh, yeah, I should have been able to name them. Uh, and uh, fourth, a taxi in a Kaluit always costs the same. It's always nine bucks, no matter where you go uh, in a taxi. And kids under 10, accompanying uh, in, by an adult, don't have to pay. And in February, actually, there's a different cost that changed because elders pay a different uh, rate. So in February, a taxi trip for elders in uh, Ikaluit went up $5 to $7 anywhere you're going. And finally, uh, fact number five, a new agreement, as you may have heard on World Report this morning, will give Nunavut control over land and resources. So as this uh, 25th anniversary is uh, celebrated, it does coincide with that major decision for the people of Iqaluit, a big land transfer. And that comes into effect today, April 1st. So you can read more about this on CBC Kids, of course, the fun five facts. But uh, you can also just read more about the stories uh, that we'll be uh, sharing out of Nunavut at cbc.ca on our national site. Well, if you were up and listening to World Report, you heard some wonderful music and we wanted you to hear all of it. So related to the 25th anniversary, here is uh, Terry Uyarak with Inuit Nunangat. <laughs>
I enjoyed that. That was Terry Uyarak in Inuit Nunanyat. Today, Nunavut marks its 25th year as a Canadian territory. And as I mentioned, if you want to read more about it, go to cbc.ca or you can check those five facts I was rattling off and more at CBC Kids. Now, you're not home with the kids anymore. Spring break has wrapped up. I hope you had a great long weekend and a lovely Easter if you celebrate. Some people are still off today, but just a reminder uh, that uh, students are back in class. So on the morning commute, it's been very quiet, dry, good conditions from what we're hearing. We haven't heard of any problems, but uh, just be aware of that. If you're out and about and you have the day off, you might not realize, uh, you know, that kids are in, unless you have kids of your own. Uh, But that will uh, make things busier around schools, of course. So 7.30, we're coming up to that time. So as we get in the next hour here, it'll get a little bit busier out there. So if you need to call us on the commute, 788-3093 is the number to update us. 788-3093 is where you can reach us here at CBC. Now, normally you would have heard sports in this half hour. I just want to mention, uh, because of Easter Monday, and it is a holiday uh, for uh, some employees here as well, across uh, our network. Uh, we do have uh, no sports today. We didn't have it on the radio, but doesn't mean you can't find it online. cbc.ca slash sports. And of course, the big mention for us locally is downtown will get busy tonight as the Jets host the Kings. Coming up, uh, we have a story about spring cleaning and not just any spring cleaning. You might be digging out and sorting through things right now, but if you have a piano in your home and you're thinking, oh, that should go to a new home, good luck finding someone to take it. That story after your CBC Winnipeg News. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg. At 7.30, it is clear. It's minus 6 in downtown Winnipeg. We're going to be sunny as we begin the month of April. Bit of a southerly breeze and a high today of 5. Well, drivers will notice the price of gas is up this morning. It's April 1st, the day the carbon tax adds about three cents to the price at the pumps for most Canadians. It's meant to encourage people to burn less fossil fuels and switch to greener forms of energy. Premier Wab Canoe says he is taking on the challenge to find an alternative to the federal carbon tax. 
Manitoba has a really strong case to make that uh, we've got a very credible path to net zero. Part of that is because of the historic investments we've made into Manitoba Hydro over the past 50 years. We have effectively decarbonized our electricity in Manitoba, and that's true today. Manitoba's budget will be released tomorrow. Premier Canoe says it includes incentives for people to help solve the climate crisis. He adds he is appealing to Ottawa to give Manitoba a break. Winnipeg police want your help finding a missing four-year-old girl. Sadie Jane Forbes is believed to be with her mother. She and 28-year-old Shasa Forbes were last seen at the McDonald's on Henderson and Fraser's Grove around 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Police believe they have since left the province and are headed west in Saskatchewan. Police say they are highly concerned for the little girl's well-being. We have photos of both the little girl and her mom up on our website this morning cbc.ca slash Manitoba. If you have seen them or if you have any information about where they are, you are asked to get in touch with police. A group of Canadians are banding together to raise awareness of a chronic disease. Lipedema Canada is launching its website today. It provides information and resources for people living with lipedema. The disease causes painful fat buildup and swelling in the arms and legs. Angel Anderson represents Manitoba within the nonprofit. She says Manitoba Health refused to cover her lipedema reduction surgeries because they considered them experimental. I get emotional talking about it because it's just like we're so passionate about it. And like I'm so fortunate that I had the resources that I could pay for it before I got to the point of being in a wheelchair because really that is it's a progressive disease and it is going to get just continue to get worse unless something is done. Anderson had to have her surgeries done in Germany, costing $90,000. She says she hopes the new nonprofit, Lipedema Canada, raises awareness about the disease. Nearly 700 of Winnipeg's most vulnerable people will be served Easter lunch today. Salome Mission will host the sit-down holiday meal starting at noon today at the Stanley Street location until 2 o'clock this afternoon. Dozens of volunteers and staff are preparing and will serve what is one of the downtown shelter's busiest meals of the year. Members of Winnipeg's Muslim community spent a busy weekend wrapping gifts for those who need them most. It was the Manitoba Islamic Association's seventh annual toy drive. The toys will be given to families in need, and and Sadia Qureshi was one of the volunteers. In our religion, one of our pillars is charity, um, and um, we're taught from a very young age to be helpful, be charitable, um, and the toy drive is a very small way that even kids can be involved. The donated toys will be distributed by the Canadian Muslim Women's Institute along with some hampers for Eid. Volunteers say they collect hundreds of toys every year during this drive. Some high school students in the Lakeshore School Division are getting in touch with nature and with history. The land-based program started about a year ago, incorporating elements of Indigenous knowledge and culture. Nahani Shorting is a grade 11 student at Ashern Central School. She is from Little Saskatchewan First Nation and has just been certified as a trapper. She and her Fellow students recently learned how to skin coyotes that were donated by a local trapper. Shorting says she can see herself as a land-based coordinator one day. Maybe I'd first take the step to help my community out. And I have multiple cousins and I would teach them. It's probably what my dad would want anyways to carry on the legacy and the knowledge of what I know about hunting and providing for your family at a young age. Lakeshore school officials say nearly half of the students in the division are Indigenous. And as of today, German adults can legally smoke cannabis. That's what it sounded like as the clock struck midnight at Berlin's Brandenburg Gate. Dozens of people gathered there to legally smoke marijuana for the first time. Germans older than 18 are allowed to carry up to 25 grams of dried cannabis, and they can grow as many as three plants at home. But it is still illegal to smoke it within 100 meters of a school, playground, or sports center. You can hear the latest national and international news coming up on World Report at 8. And you can find more Manitoba news at cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Thank you, Heather Wells. You're welcome. Regional forecast now in 
Winnipeg, mainly sunny today, a high 5. It's mainly clear right now and mine is 6. In Brandon today, sunny and a high of 3 degrees. Winds are going to be southwest 20 to 40. And uh, that's actually similar to Winnipeg, by the way, so a little bit breezy. Brandon's high is uh, 3, and right now it's minus 6 as well. And up in Thompson, it's mostly cloudy and minus 10. It's going to stay cloudy for you today and a high of 1 degree. And uh, winds will be about 15K for you uh, up in Thompson. Uh, keep in mind, of course, it's spring. That means that wind chill factored in makes it still feel a little bit chilly out there and it's going to be a little bit icy and crunchy if you are walking. Uh, Dylan Longhurst is in now to talk uh, about our commute. Yeah, and it's a quiet one. Not much happening this Easter Monday out there on the road. So, of course, if that changes for you and you see something uh, getting in your way, whatever it is, you know, we always appreciate the calls. Let us know. Call 204-788-3093. Or you can tell us about the best April Fool's prank, I guess, that was ever played on you, if it's if it's a good one. I keep forgetting it's also April Fool's today, which is probably both good and to my detriment eventually. So I have to be really <laughs> careful around, uh, well, everyone. Being fooled? Yeah. Don't worry, I won't do anything to you. Oh, I'm goodness. not a fan of a prank. I'm one of those, like, people. People, some people think I'm a stick in the mud for this, but I'm just not a fan of it. I'm like, why would you stress someone out? Like, I'm always like nervous enough myself. I'm for the ones that are uh, like exciting. Like, ooh, that's a cool idea. I wish that was real. You yeah. come away being like, oh, I, now now you're not doing it. And yeah. I want it. I know a university once promised equestrian studies here got in the it. city. I'm like, I want to learn about horses. Oh, I got taken for a ride. But on bump. <laughs> It is 23 minutes to 8 o'clock now. Now, if you did have the long weekend, of course, uh, people having Friday off, um, most people, you might have started some spring cleaning, digging through the house. But if you have an old piano sitting in a corner of your house, good luck finding it a new home. Last summer, our now-retired senior producer of audio here at CBC Manitoba went on a musical journey to find out why that's the case. It all started when Janice Moeller took note of some online ads. Good morning, Marcy. So what did you notice about pianos? Well, I, I spend too much time on buy and sell apps like Facebook Marketplace, and I noticed a lot of pianos for free. You know, the deal is usually that you have to move them, sometimes out of someone's basement. Most ads come with a warning, this is going to be heavy. <laughs> so, And most of these pianos are large, upright, wooden pianos. And I, I noticed that some people were even offering to pay people to take the piano. They'll give you money to take it. This ad in particular caught my eye. Large shelf for sale, $5.00. This big shelf was in our house when we bought it. The top part works great for holding stuff. Middle tier is a bit loud. It's an antique, Canadian made from 1921. And for some reason, it's like 800 pounds. <laughs> Witty poster there. So whose large shelf, a.k.a. piano, is, uh, is this? It belongs to Jenna Warriner. She and her partner bought a house in the Grand Beach area. And as the ad says, a condition of the sale was that the piano goes with the house. She did take piano lessons when she was younger, but doesn't play anymore. And the instrument took up a lot of room in the house. So when they moved in, she set out to give it away. I reached out to an antique dealer because it's from 1921. It's Canadian made. It was a beautiful instrument. Uh, we reached out to some schools. I talked to some people with connections at churches. I listed it in different online marketplaces multiple times. Uh, we spoke to our entire network of friends and family. That we, we tried really hard to send it off to a good home, and we couldn't find anyone that wanted it. And she was even willing to pay to get it moved. A family member was about to take it, but then they were offered another one, and that was a family heirloom, so they had to take that one instead. So Jenna set a deadline to get rid of it. She kept extending it because they agreed if they couldn't give it away, they would dismantle it. What happened? Well, that ad I read was their final attempt. So they took the piano apart. They researched it on YouTube because it can be dangerous to just smash it, mostly because the strings are under so much tension. It took two days and they went through countless drill bits to undo all the screws. But taking it apart, even that carefully, it, it still broke her heart. And I just broke down crying. Like it felt like we were murderers. <laughs> I feel like these are going to be relics of days gone by where when I grew up, it was a given that a lot of our friends, like like I said, we had one in the house. Lots of people had one in the house. It was normal. And then it slowly becomes a shelf and it slowly becomes like gets decorated at Christmas or maybe you sing carols at Christmas around it and then it gets closed and then it goes out of tune and they just sort of get left behind. And I think that we probably took them for granted growing up when they were all over the place and in every church and every church basement and every school classroom. 
They kept the bench. It's now a piece of furniture in the house. And they kept some of the wood. They've already made some shelves. So you alluded to this a little bit. How common is it that pianos are unwanted? It's heartbreakingly common. Uh, Listen to this. And I should warn music lovers everywhere. This might be a little bit hard to hear. Martin Winiarski is pulling a medium-sized upright from the back of a truck. He owns Piano Movers Winnipeg. He gives me the task of pushing it over. Oh, that's heartbreaking. (laughs) He pulls off some of the parts, breaking them off with his bare hands. And next comes the sledgehammer, and he breaks off the sides. Then he pulls off the front, exposing the guts of the piano known as the harp. (laughs) Next, he cuts the strings. Now this is the dangerous part. The strings are tight, under about 400 pounds of tension per string, and the low notes are heavy wire. They go shooting across the drive as they are cut. Next, he breaks up the cast iron part of the harp, and this has to hold all the tension of those strings. It's the heaviest part of the piano, and pretty tough to break. All right, this is uh, is where we smash the metal. It gets really loud. So in a matter of minutes, a piano that lived in a Manitoba cabin for decades is now just a pile of rubble. There we go. Marcy, the look on your face. Oh, my gosh. I think it's the sound more than anything and the tension and things you might not have thought about and the shooting strings and the, and then, yeah, the sadness, right? Like, it's a moment. And it's a loss. You know, Martin has six more pianos in his garage right now. In the past three and a half years, he's gotten about 135 pianos for disposal, and the owners just have to get rid of them. He sells the ones that are in good condition. He's given away about 30 or 40 to different charities. He has some artists who take some of the ornate wood pieces and some of the other parts. He gives pieces to piano tuners he knows to help prolong the lifespan of other pianos. He'll recycle the metal, but the rest of the wood and the other parts can get burned or go to the landfill. He figures he's had to destroy about 65 pianos. That many, eh? And he says, you know, the first one was hard. And it's even tougher on many of the people who have to give up their pianos. Oh, I've had many tears. I've had, I've had to get some hugs before, and they're very sentimental to their piano. But most of the time, the piano is just it's too old and it's too expensive to repair. He charges 300 to $400 to move a piano, depending on what floor it's on, how big and heavy it is, and how far it has to be moved. And he's consistently busy, especially during the pandemic. People were taking pianos because they actually had time to learn how to play. Why is this happening? Why, why are there so many unwanted pianos? Well, there are quite a few factors at play. Jay Taylor is a longtime piano tuner and technician in the city. He uh, even tunes the Steinway Concert Grand. And um, that's more of the the style people want these days, shiny and black. They just look more modern in someone's house. You can also get an electronic keyboard these days in a really wide range of prices, and they're a lot more portable. Jay says the piano used to be central to a lot of families, but not anymore. I don't think people have the disposable income to, uh, you know, have everything. Some people, yes, but most people, it's a choice, you know, plus time commitment, uh, Kids don't see piano in the world a lot, you know, so uh, aside from certain major artists, uh, you know, uh, that people just assume that if you can sing, you can play an instrument, which is not necessarily true. It takes a lot of hard work and time and effort, such a thing. So, Is a free piano really free? Well, that's where Jay comes in. To tune a piano, he has to adjust 230 strings. Each key has two or three of them. They all get adjusted with a special tool that looks like a wrench. Jay's experienced, so tuning normally takes one or two hours, and that would cost about 100 to 125 bucks. If the piano hasn't been played in a long time, it might need multiple tunings to hold its pitch. A lot of these free pianos are about 100 years old, and they have a lifespan like anything. The wood can dry out, so Jay advises people watch out for a lot of cracks, look for rust inside or broken parts. Jay says the beauty of these big uprights is the bigger the instrument, the better the sound, the bigger the keys, and the nicer they are to play. 
But they aren't without risk. And Jay says repairs can cost up to thousands of dollars. What can it mean to someone, though, on the other side of this to get a piano to receive one? Well, here's where we can end on a high note. That's 13-year-old Nayla Suleiman. She's been taking lessons for two years. She got a piano from her neighbour. The neighbor's mom passed away, and because Nayla had expressed interest in the instrument, the piano was hers. It's apartment size, so it was easier to move into its basement, uh, into the basement of their Bridgewater home. Now, Nayla had her first recital recently, and she's gotten more interested in music-related programs at school, and she's seeing other effects from having the piano. I feel like piano is helping me, like, to study more because when you're doing piano, you have to like know the notes and know the keys. <laughs> yeah, lots of discipline. So those are great skills to have, as Nayla hopes to be a surgeon one day. And she loves playing piano, and it's not even a battle to get her to practice. So Marcy, piano mover, $300. Piano tuner, $125. Happy musical teenager, priceless. <laughs> <laughs> it absolutely is. And a lifelong uh, love and learning of music uh, begins. Thanks so much, Janice, for bringing in the story. My pleasure, Marcy. That is now retired senior producer of audio, Janice Moeller. She took us on that musical journey last summer. And uh, we thought we'd uh, use that this morning as an encore presentation because spring has sprung April 1st. And we just had a long weekend. You might have been digging through the house. And maybe you're trying to give a piano a new home. If you are, what's your story? with uh, trying to uh, move it on to another family. 204-788-3205. Sing and sway to R&B on Marvin's Room. Move and groove to the rhythm of Saturday Night Jazz. Crest with the best next wave of Indigenous music on Reclaim. Savor the flavor of the Francophone world on C'est Formidable. And treasure the arias and encores on Tempo Weekends. Saturday Night Means Music on CBC Radio 1 and on the CBC Listen app. Mainly clear in Winnipeg. In fact, a nice blue sky out our studio window here on Portage Ave. It's minus 6 in the city, minus 6 also in Brandon and in Thompson. It is minus 10 degrees. Today in Winnipeg, going to be sunny all day, a high of 5 degrees. So I suspect if the kids are layered up going to school this morning, it's going to be a little warmer for this afternoon. Coming up on the program after 8 o'clock, a heat pump is touted as a great way to cut costs and cut your carbon footprint. But how do they work? Is it right for you? And how effective are they at warming up our frigid prairie homes in the heart of winter? Heat Pumps 101 is coming up as uh, we're all talking today about the increase in the carbon tax, the budget tomorrow, and there are some rebates for heat pumps. So, uh, but how do they work? That's after 8. Also after 8, Salome Mission is hosting their annual Easter meal today. They expect about 700 people so they're up cooking and really busy already but we're going to dip into their kitchen after eight to find out how that uh, prep for that meal later today is coming along right now though on the show the ndp government is going to open a supervised consumption site somewhere in downtown winnipeg we are expecting we might get some more details tomorrow in the budget and we did just get the numbers uh, last week about drug deaths in this province for 2023 and they are surging 445 people died in 2023. Jamil Mahmood is the executive director of Main Street Project. They provide safe spaces and supports for people experiencing homelessness and addiction issues. And he joined me last fall after the government officially com committed to a consumption site. And Mahmood has been a longtime advocate and he greeted that news with pleasure. Yeah, we're pretty excited. I mean, this has been years of advocacy from the harm reduction community, our, our community asking for these kind of simple solutions to the problems we're seeing every day in the community. So we're we're very hopeful and excited at this point. Um, and uh, to see the commitment that was an election promise we put in a minister letter is, is pretty exciting. That uh, makes us feel like we're going to make it happen. So, Give us uh, some sense of uh, how often you might deal with overdose in our community, in our city. Yeah, organizations dealing with it all the time. You know, we're seeing it in our shelter often. You know, I think we're reversing, you know, at least one or two overdoses a day right now. And, and it depends on the drug supply, obviously, uh, that changes. But I know also through our outreach program, through training folks to provide naloxone in the community, we're seeing, you know, uh, higher each month seems to be increasing. Um, and uh, we have, you know, no additional tools really to, to, you know, provide safety for folks who are using substances. How often 
might you have to administer naloxone in a shift, for example? Yeah, it really depends. Uh, you know, like we're seeing sometimes three or four overdose a shift that maybe, you know, up to 20, 20 doses of naloxone uh, on a shift sometimes. Um, you know, we're looking at bringing in oxygen to also support uh, providing oxygen when people are overdosing now. And then also with the tra- changing drug supply, naloxone doesn't uh, work as quickly or in the same ways as it did, you know, say two or three years ago. Uh, the different substances of drugs changes that reaction. So sometimes it takes a lot more doses to reverse an overdose. I just want to revisit something. You said that sometimes in a shift, of course, it depends. But that's a real number that, that staff would have to, in Main Street Project, for example, um, administer naloxone like 20 times to save people's lives? Yeah, like on average, like it used to be, you know, you'd administer one or two doses to reverse an overdose. Now we're seeing sometimes it'll take eight to 10 uh, vials of naloxone to reverse an overdose. So even just for something like one or two overdoses, we may be using 20, uh, 20 doses of naloxone. What role do you hope to play in the, in to, in the establishment of this site? Yeah, we're we're hoping to be an an active, you know, partner on making this happen. You know, as an organization, through our work uh, on truth and reconciliation, we've really committed to making sure that Indigenous organizations in the city get first opportunity to take on new new projects or initiatives. So that's our commitment is to support a potential Indigenous partner to lead this. And if uh, the community comes back and says, you know, Main Street Project's best group to lead this, we're happy to step in. Either way, we're going to be involved uh, every step of the way in in helping as a community. And we have a pretty strong and, and supportive of harm reduction community through the organizations in our city. So, um, you know, any number of agencies would be great great to take this on and we'll be there to partner any way we can. Where would you put it? Uh, you know, I think there's there's many locations. I think we've seen success in the neighborhood through what we've uh, been uh, seen from the mobile overdose prevention site this year, uh, located on Main Street. That So somewhere in the area, I think, is a good starting point. We also know that through the research done in the past, that, that a city like Winnipeg would probably need three to five such locations to actually be meeting the needs of, of the community. So uh, one's a start, but we know uh, we know that there's more needed. Uh, you were talking about the mobile overdose overdose unit. Can you talk a little bit about what uh, what you've learned from from their work in our community? Yeah, I mean, I think the work that Sunshine House has done to set up the mobile overdose prevention site and and run that program has been amazing. I think the the first year of rec- data that's come in so far has really shown that by providing that location, they're seeing a uh, significant loss. I think the numbers are something like seventeen thousand visits in the first year and only twenty one uses of naloxone. So if you compare that to you know kind of what we're seeing on a daily basis in in shelter or other programs and uh, you know that that alone you know reducing the amount of time people would need to use naloxone would reduce trauma and those impacts on on our community a lot. Uh, what should a safe consumption site look like from your experience like have you looked at other places obviously you have best practices from other places that you feel should be applied in terms of physically uh, how, you know, how big it should be maybe how what, what kind of hours it should be 24 hours or what's your sense of that? Yeah I mean we're as a 24-hour organization we're always an advocate that the services need to be there all the time for people. So, you know, I think as much as possible, you know, there's lots of questions. How much funding is coming? What what the funding can be used for? So we don't, like, there's a lot we don't know at this point, but, uh, you know, for us, there's so many different models. I think what we, we would want to make sure is that whatever model we go with, that there's a strong peer-led component of, of people who use drugs, uh, um, whether currently or, or in the past, are, are kind of the ones leading. They're the experts in knowing what people need and how to support folks. So I think whatever model we go with, there'll obviously be some medical components, but there's, with Safe Consumption you can go full medical model where it's fully staffed by medical professionals or you can go fully the peer run models with just some medical oversight. So we're really open to whatever. It's really going to depend on on the funding and resources available to make it happen. But uh, making sure that there's there's peers in there and that they're leading the work because uh, that'll make sure it works for the people that are using drugs. Uh, some people might be listening and there has been debate and pushback from some in the community. Uh, critics of the sites uh, believe it could promote drug use or it could introduce even different drugs to someone uh, if they go to use one drug and there's another drug there that they actually could end up becoming addicted to something else. What's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, I I think the it's a personal journey for folks. Um, I think there's drugs everywhere, right? So whether you're getting drugs uh, at a safe consumption site or in a back alley or from, you know, someone's basement or a dealer, right? Like you're going to encounter different drugs wherever you are if you're someone who's using drugs. So I think um, I think the goal is that a safe consumption site will be a place where people can use, be safe, uh, but then also be connected to resources to support whatever uh, potential, you know, whether it's getting into recovery, whether it's going to detox, whether it's accessing housing or other programs. Um, and we we know that if we can take bigger steps to address things like poverty and um, and those root causes of why people are maybe using substances, 
prices and um, and the lack of housing for folks. And then we know that's also a big step in making sure that people are safer when they 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 uh, are using drugs or in the community. So I don't know if there's there's not one perfect solution, and and no one's saying that a safe consumption site would solve uh, overdose or drug problems. What we do know by all the data and research is that it would reduce the number of deaths uh, and potentially eliminate them if if we can get everyone using safe consumption sites. It's an opportunity to give people the the services they need to keep them alive to make sure they're using uh, you know a substance that isn't going to kill them. It's about you know we also need to talk about regulated drug supply. We don't have that right. Street drugs are toxic. We don't know what's in them. So a safe supply program would go a long way too. But uh, we really need to make sure that we're providing. Um, the community, what they need to be safe and, and providing people the ability to get into recovery. You can't recover if you're dead. And, and I know that sounds very harsh to say and, and that, but it, it's the truth. If people don't have the ability to be healthy and safe till the point when they're ready to go for recovery, we know that addiction recovery doesn't work unless people are, are ready to do it. Forced recovery is not something that works. And then there's tons of evidence on that. So you really need to make sure people have the services they need to stay alive, to be able to access the care when they're ready for it. Uh, when do you hope to see a rollout of a first site? Yeah, I mean, I think we could mobilize quickly. I think it's it's really where's the location, where's the money, yeah, yesterday, and let's go, right? right? Like, Because yeah. I think we have models for how the overdose pre- mobile overdose prevention site got set up and run. We have reports already on, on what it could look like in Winnipeg and, and so it's all there. It's just the matter of, of kind of the space and the, the funding to make it happen. So that's Jamil Mahmoud, the Executive Director of Main Street Project. We were speaking there last fall. Now, tomorrow, we are expecting we could get some details about the safe consumption site uh, that will be shared in the provincial budget. It is three minutes to eight o'clock. Heather Walls is in with headlines. Good morning. Well, April 1st, the day the carbon tax adds about three cents a litre to the price of the pumps in Manitoba. It's meant to encourage you to burn less fossil fuel and switch to greener forms of energy. Premier Wapkanu says he's taking on the challenge to find an alternative to the federal carbon tax. Manitoba's budget out tomorrow, and Premier Canu says it includes incentives to help you solve the climate crisis. Nearly 700 of Winnipeg's most vulnerable people will be served Easter lunch today. Salome Mission at 303 Stanley is going to host the sit-down holiday meal starting at noon today. It runs until 2 this afternoon. I'll be back with more Manitoba News at 8.30. All right, thanks, Heather. You're welcome. We're going to talk to Salome, actually, out of their busy kitchen. They'll give us a couple minutes live after 8 o'clock. We'll find out how that prep is going for that big meal. Also, we're going to talk about uh, heat pumps. Uh, That is one of the uh, things that the NDP put forward. Uh, trying to offer initiatives for people to put heat pumps into their homes. But is it right for you? How do they work? Uh, that conversation's coming up also after 8. Minus 6 and mainly clear in Winnipeg. And Dylan Longhurst has a uh, commute note. Yes, we did hear about a stalled vehicle on southbound Lage Modier just past Dougal. Uh, heard about that about 20 minutes ago, so that may still be an issue for you on the commute. You'll want to keep right to pass. Any updates or anything else you see out there? 204-788-3093. Thanks, Dylan. Well, stay with us on this Easter Monday. Our program continues. World Report, though, is next at 8. You're with CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or on YouTube. The last time Cheryl Crow was on the show, she said she was probably done making records. She'll tell you how thinking about the dangers of artificial intelligence motivated her to get back into the studio making new music. Q, this morning at 10, 10.30 in Newfoundland, and on the CBC Listen app, or wherever you get your podcasts. The CBC News is next, coming up in half an hour... It's The Current with Matt Galloway. Mexico City's 22 million residents are having trouble getting access to water. And in three months, they may reach day zero, where the water will run out. How the world is struggling with drought, coming up on The Current. This is World Report. Good morning, I'm Marcia Young.
Despite protests from some premiers, the national price on carbon is rising. It happens every April 1st. That means people across most of the country will likely see a price bump at the pump. But federal carbon rebates will also increase in provinces that receive them. As David Thurton reports, not many Canadians know they get that money back. You're, you're a resident of Ontario, right? Yeah. And you're not sure if you got the rebate? No. No. On the streets of Ottawa, questions about the federal carbon tax and the money some get back. The national carbon price rises today. What about yourself? Do you think you're getting more back? No. You think you're losing money? Yeah. The price on carbon rises from $65 per ton to $80 at the pump. That increase means some will pay about an extra three cents a litre. Adults receive federal rebates, which researchers say for many exceed the carbon tax paid. And as the price rises, so it is the rebates. Sarah Hastings Simon is a professor at the University of Calgary. She studies low carbon energy transitions, including carbon pricing. We know that the vast majority of Canadians are actually getting back more than they pay. So uh, for those that are seeing those direct deposits come, I know a lot of people don't get checks in the mail anymore. They just kind of end up in your bank account. Um, you will see that that amount go up. Um, and I think sometimes there's some confusion as well. You, you get this payment quarterly. So Payments arrive every three months. The next one is expected in as early as two weeks. Rural residents could soon see a 20% top-up on their rebates since many living in small towns tend to drive more. Their homes also use more energy. David Thurton, CBC News, Ottawa. Israel says its military operation at Gaza's biggest hospital is over. Images and video of Al-Shifa Hospital show rooms burned out. Entire buildings in the complex are rubble. The Israel Defense Force says the facility in Gaza City was being used as a Hamas base. Israel's prime minister says more than 200 terrorists were killed. The Hamas-run Gaza Health Ministry says dozens of bodies were found in and around the hospital. Turkish voters have delivered a major blow to President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Local elections were held yesterday, and the country's main opposition party swept some key cities, including Istanbul and Ankara. It is the worst electoral loss Erdogan's party has suffered in more than two decades. Freelance reporter Dorian Jones has more. Supporters of the main opposition, Republican People's Party, celebrated victories across the country. This supporter, Jale Chanel, says she's looking to a brighter future. I have hopes for the new era. I expect the future to be good for retirees, for young people, for children, for women. The opposition won control of most of Turkey's main cities, dealing Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan his worst electoral defeat. Erdogan led the campaign to retake Istanbul, but was resoundingly defeated by incumbent Ekrem Imamoglu. Addressing thousands of supporters, Imamoglu, widely tipped as a future presidential candidate, said a blow against Erdogan's authoritarian rule has been dealt. The period of one-man rule is over as of today. It is done. The republic and democracy is going full speed ahead from now on. Near 70% inflation and interest rates of 50% are seen as the main factors behind the Turkish president's resounding defeat. Erdogan, addressing supporters in Ankara, said they would learn the lessons of the vote and move on. But that will be difficult with a resurgent opposition. Dorian Jones, CBC News, Istanbul. South Korea's president is promising to push forward with a plan to increase medical school admissions. There is strong pushback from doctors in his country. Yun suk says he needs medical schools to allow an extra 2,000 people in each year. South Korea has a shortage of doctors to help treat an aging society, but interns and medical residents have been protesting the move for the past six weeks. They have forced hundreds of surgeries and treatments to be canceled. They say schools cannot handle the abrupt addition of that many new students, and doctors will not get the training they need.
A Montreal couple's experience is revealing how costly a safety recall can be for consumers. They were told their truck had a defect that could lead to a sudden loss of power, but for nearly two years, the car maker had no permanent fix and the couple had nowhere to turn. They took their story to Rosa Marcatelli and our Go Public team. It may result in an unexpected loss of motive power, which can cause a vehicle to crash without problem. Michelle Ashenden got that urgent recall notice for their 2016 Dodge Ram 1500 way back in June 2022. Almost two years later, she was still waiting for a permanent fix. We never thought in a million years we'd be waiting this long. Her husband, Vittorio Polcini, says the truck was too dangerous to drive. It will just randomly shut off while driving, 100% completely black. The couple no got power. the truck towed to their local dealership. Meantime, they racked up thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs for rental vehicles and more. Transport Canada estimates one in five vehicles has an unresolved safety recall. It's not clear how many of those are because automakers don't have a fix. Giorgini is from the Automobile Protection Association. Transport Canada should be able to hold the manufacturer accountable. Transport Canada tells Go Public they don't set deadlines for recalls so automakers can control the process to ensure vehicle safety. Stellantis manufactures and sells Ram trucks. It says this particular recall needed redesigned fuel system components and more. After Go Public inquiries, the automaker said it will look at reimbursing the couple for their out of pocket costs. So, money out of pocket, mistreated. A permanent fix became available a month ago, too late for the couple. They traded the truck in at a different dealership. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Wildlife rescuers on Vancouver Island are keeping an eye on the tides. They're hoping the water will work with them to help free an orphaned orca trapped in a lagoon. They have to coax the two-year-old whale over a sandbar and out into the open ocean. Its mother died more than a week ago. She beached at the lagoon. The low tide forced rescuers to pause their efforts over the weekend. In one week, millions of people are expected to look up for a rare celestial event, a total solar eclipse. They have been around for, well, as long as there's been a moon, but an eclipse still presents a rare opportunity to research the natural world. Science reporter Anand Ram has more. Zebra's hooves crunch through the snow, part of a quiet afternoon at the Granby Zoo, east of Montreal. But on April 8th, the animals here will be under close watch to see how they react to a total solar eclipse. Our Japanese macaques are probably going to go a little bit crazy. Chelsea Paquette is a conservation coordinator at the zoo. We think that they might vocalize, uh, huddle in the group together. They might actually look at the, the sun or lack thereof. Captive subjects are one thing, but other researchers are studying animals out in the wild, as many depend on the sun for navigation. Cecilia Nielsen is a researcher at Lund University in Sweden. Light is such a ubiquitous cue that really like goes through everything. She studied bird and insect movement during a previous eclipse in 2017, finding a drop in animal activity. Her theory? They were probably interpreting it more as like a gathering storm or something like that because it's like slowly getting darker and then for a short period it's very dark. Insects, which react quicker to changes in light, might be confused. Nazine Huber is with the University of Northern British Columbia. I would expect that some uh, insects like honeybees might have some trouble navigating briefly. But when the sun comes back a few short minutes later, researchers say these animals have inbuilt mechanisms to reorient themselves and get on with their day. Anand Ram, CBC News, Toronto. LeBron James is not slowing down. He'll turn 40 in December, but last night... James put up 40 points to help L.A. to a 116-104 win over the Brooklyn Nets. It is a significant achievement for James. He's just the second NBA player to score 40 points in more than one NBA game after his 39th birthday. Michael Jordan is the only other player to achieve that feat, and he did it three times before he retired at age 40. <laughs> and that is the latest national and international news from World Report. No one here is retiring. I'm Marcia Young. <laughs>
When your name is Marcia Young, when do you retire? Good morning, everyone. I'm Marcy Marcusa. This is Information Radio. We're live in downtown Winnipeg under a blue sky. Really nice clear blue sky, actually. It's sunny and minus 5. We're going to go to a high of 5 above today. And uh, thanks for joining us here on Information Radio on CBC, 89.3 FM, 9.90 AM on the app or YouTube. Anywhere you're finding us, well, we're going to talk this half hour to Salome Mission. They're up early and busy this morning. They are getting ready for an annual Easter meal they're having today. They're expecting to host about 700 people. So we're going to touch base with the kitchen and we'll find out how prep's coming along. So stay tuned for that. In addition, this half hour on the show, our whole show this morning actually has been uh, much of it, looking at tomorrow's provincial budget and things uh, to tee up and keep in mind. So with climate action and incentives in mind, how do heat pumps actually work? We'll have that discussion this half hour, a kind of a heat pumps 101, whether or not uh, you're one of those people out there that are thinking, well, is this the right decision for my family as I'm looking at, uh, you know, out around the house this button in our own family's budget rather, and you're looking around your home for improvements this year. So stay tuned. We'll get, uh, we'll look at that and we'll find out how they work to uh, cut your carbon footprint. Right now, let's go to Heather Wells. She is in this morning as well at 8.11 and has our headlines. Good morning. Well, Winnipeg police say they are highly concerned for the well-being of a missing four-year-old girl. Sadie Jane Forbes is believed to be with her mother. They were last seen at the McDonald's on Henderson and Fraser's Grove yesterday afternoon and police believe they've since left the province and are heading west in Saskatchewan. You may notice gas prices are higher this morning. It is the day the carbon tax is imposed on provinces without a carbon pricing plan of their own. And it's just a day before Manitoba's provincial budget. A budget Premier Wab Canoe says has many green incentives and will show why Manitoba should be exempt from the carbon tax. I'll be back with more Manitoba news at 8.30. All right. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. And speaking of getting out and about and around, uh, following the commute this morning, Dylan Longhurst. Yeah, we heard about a stalled vehicle on southbound Lage Modier just past Dougald about 30 minute, minutes ago. That vehicle sitting in the median lane, so traffic want to keep right to pass. May no longer be an issue, but something to be aware of traveling southbound on Lage this morning. Anything else you see out there, do let us know. Call 204-788-3093. Well, as we mentioned, dozens of staff and volunteers at Salom Mission Kitchen are going to be busy today, chopping, frying, and baking food, and up early, making around 700 meals. They are hosting their annual Easter feast this afternoon. And uh, Mary Lou Castro is food services manager, who is uh, there now, and I understand probably pretty busy. Hi there. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How are you this morning? We're excited. Yeah. What do you love about this time of year and this uh, event every year, I should say, Mary Lou? Yeah. Um, I just love making people happy, especially <clears throat> on our three big meals. And one of the meal is our um, Easter, which is very special. All the big meals are special, but this one is extra special because we wanted our community members to feel like they're going home to their families and having a good meal. I love that. So what does that mean for what you put out on the table and the environment today? What's it going to be like? So um, now we're, as I said, we're preparing for 700 to 750 plates for community members. We're having roast turkey, gravy that we're making from scratch, 74 liters of those, and then three, uh, 240 pounds of potatoes, 200 pounds of uh, coleslaw, and 800 pieces of stuffing balls. <laughs> what time did, what time <laughs> it did seems you get? like a lot. Yeah. We yeah. need two months to prep. <laughs> what time did you get to work this morning? Yes. What time did you come in this morning, Mary Lou? 5.30. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. Um, and we're serving for two hours. Wow. Uh, lots of volunteers going to be helping you out today to make sure this happens for people? Absolutely. We rely on volunteers. And the reason why we need two months to prep is because we're serving every day, three meals a day, seven days a week. Um, in terms of the reaction you get from people on these big dinners, especially on these occasions, you said you try to make this Easter meal feel like, you know, family. W yes. What do you hear from people? Oh, they love it. They're looking forward to it. You know what? Even if they know when it's going to be, 
they, they keep phoning us just to make sure that, okay, Merlu, it's still two hours. And then, yes. And then because every big meal that we have, it's a sit down. So they don't, they don't need to line up, right? They're being served. That's how special our big meal is. Um, what, what motivates you, Mary Lou, to be involved with Salome Mission? Um, you know, year round, uh, even just outside of these meals, what's, uh, what, what do you feel like when you're doing your work there? You know what? I've been here for 12 years. And with my 12 years of coming to my kitchen, I don't, I don't remember that I'm not excited. I'm always excited. And it's, it, it feels good. It's, I'm not going to lie. This is not for everybody being on your feet for, for eight hours. But be, seeing the smile for, uh, from our community members and making sure that they're well fed, it, my heart is full, you know. And with the directions that we're going now, being housing focused, just so happy. It's just there is no amount of money that can match that. That's a, that's a, that's a gift that I take home every day. How have you been handling the increases in in uh, in food costs? Given that you, you know you you're 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 in the ser- food services manager there, and then, pardon me, even for today's meal, we're talking feeding seven hundred people. That must be a stretch. But you know what? We are blessed. We are blessed with a friendly and generous Manitobans. Like we have the Hadarite Colony, who's been our partner and and giving us all the produce. If we don't have any, like potatoes, the pies, they baked it from scratch for us. And also, we have a natural bakery. It's like the, the, the donation. It's like our longtime partner that keeps this place running. What kind of pie are you going to have? <laughs> there is three kinds of pie. Nice. There is Saskatoon, there's apple, and there's uh, rhubarb. Um, I can save the table for you. Uh, what's that? <laughs> No, I, I'm all right. Thank you. I think if uh, if we get more, I'm, uh, if, uh, I was blessed with food yesterday with my family. So okay. I'll, I'll leave those seats for folks that are going to come out and enjoy the meal. I'm so, just kidding. I know. How are things going so far this morning, Mary Lou? What does the kitchen look like? And are oh, you you're organizing it's, it's, everything? Yeah, it's pretty busy. We have 14 uh, volunteers now because we are start prepping for breakfast. We're serving breakfast from 9 to 10. So after that, and then simultaneously, I'm I'm trying to season the turkeys, and then the the um, the coleslaw, yeah, potatoes are, are being boiled. That's and, the order and of also events. The gravy. So how many liters is going on? How many turkeys are you doing? Two hundred and forty, because we only um, use the turkey breast. Two hundred and forty so turkeys. Two hundred forty turkeys. Wow, the are turkey. they coming? Where are you cooking them all? Like, are they coming from... No, so for two months, like two months before that, we start cutting every week 30 pieces of turkeys every week. That's how so you've managed So what I do it. is we save all the turkey breast in the freezer yeah. and the... the um, the of dark course. meat we serve. Of course. So meat. now it makes sense. You said it takes months to prepare. I'm thinking to myself, how is all this coming together? I get it. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you stepped away. I know the kitchen is crazy busy. Thank you for the conversation. And thank you for what everyone is doing over there at Salome today. I hope you have a beautiful Easter meal. Thank you. Oh, you too. Thank you. That's Mary Lou Castro. She's running the kitchen. She's the food services manager over at Salome Mission. And as we mentioned, later today, uh, she and uh, dozens of staff and volunteers will come together and serve a sit-down meal uh, for Easter. Their feast is expected to uh, serve about seven to 750 people. Whether it's breaking news from around the world, across the country, or in your own hometown, it's all at your fingertips on the CBC News app. Get the top stories from where you live under the local tab, or watch video clips, live events, and the national on your smartphone or tablet. Get all the news you want, when you want it, where you want it, with the CBC News app. Download the app for free today. 8.20 is the time right now. How you doing out there on this Monday morning? A lot of people are off today. Uh, many are not. I know school is in, for example. Spring break's behind us. And it's 
only kind of a bummer that last week was a little bit chilly and this week looks promising because if you were off with the kids, you might be thinking, oh, where were those double digit highs? But they're going to be there for us this week and we uh, can't complain, obviously, in this province. We had a very mild winter, barely any snow in Winnipeg. And uh, unfortunately, not enough to, uh, you know, not be worried about drought this spring. So that's going to be a story that will be certainly staying on top of this spring. A lot more snow in western Manitoba. I know we were out that way the last two weeks, and it's uh, it's really noticeable once you get outside the perimeter uh, just to how spared Winnipeg was from, uh, from lots of snow. But it's still only April 1st, folks, so we'll see what the month's going to bring. But right now it is sunny in Winnipeg, nice blue sky, minus 5, and we're going to be 5 above. So uh, it's going to be plus 5 for the day. Lots of sunshine and just a little bit windy wind south 20 to 40 this afternoon. So you'll feel it, but nothing too crazy in terms of the wind. It's supposed to rain tonight. Well, tomorrow, as we continue to tell you, Manitoba's NDP will deliver its first budget since being elected last fall. Now, during their election campaign, election uh, premier, rather, Wab Canoe, promised to install 5,000 heat pumps to help Manitobans reduce their carbon footprint. So we started to wonder how do heat pumps work? Can they stand up to the coldest days in our prairie winters? Jana Brunel gave us a crash course in Heat Pumps 101 last November. She is Strategic Initiatives Manager at Efficiency Manitoba. Good morning. So there's two kinds of heat pumps, right? So can you explain them? Yeah, you bet. There are two types, air source and ground source. Both types of heat pumps provide an energy efficient way to heat homes and buildings. So an air source heat pump provides that efficient heating and cooling in one unit by using a small amount of energy to pull heat from the outdoor air to warm your home. In the summer months, it works in reverse to push that warm air outside to cool your home. So a ground source heat pump, uh, which we've often heard people refer to as a geothermal heat pump, it circulates fluid through a loop of pipes buried underground, and in the heating mode, it absorbs that heat from the earth and brings that in to warm your home. Our understanding is that Premier Canoe uh, referenced ground source heat pumps in in the the election discussion. However, uh, air source heat pumps are are something that Efficiency Manitoba also promotes and and have incentives on. So when you look at, um, you know, how they work, uh, you know, in terms of efficiency and also upfront costs, can you help us with how to compare through that lens? Happy to do that. An air source heat pump is is an easier installation. Uh, it can reduce electric heating costs by up to 30%, and it allows that heating and cooling. So we, we do see people uh, look to install an air source heat pump when an air conditioning unit might fail. An air source heat pump is going to cost between eight and $16,000, depending on if it's a ductless or centrally ducted system. And if you uh, go for the cold climate version, you're going to see a more effective installation in our Manitoba season. Would you suggest going for a cold climate? Like, I mean, you hear that and you think that's got to be what we go for in Manitoba. Do the, does it work if you don't go for that one? Uh, a cold climate air source heat pump can operate until about minus 15 degrees Celsius. So it, it is more effective in our in our winters. However, on the coldest days of the year, uh, a customer's primary or auxiliary heating system, whether that's an electric furnace or natural gas furnace, will be used. So you, you cannot use the air source heat pump, you know, in the middle of January. So it's almost like a hybrid car. Sometimes you're on gas, sometimes you're in electricity. That pump yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, so if a customer has an electric furnace already and they install an, uh, an air source heat pump, they're going to see a reduction in their electric energy uh, costs. And uh, because that air source heat pump will be working. But we do have customers who have a natural gas furnace that install the air source heat pump. And that's going to reduce your natural gas consumption, which which results in less greenhouse gas emissions and uh, will will help benefit uh, customers that way. OK, let's get to uh, ground source heat pumps, uh, geothermal, obviously a bigger operation. You have to have the land and the space to be able to put in those pipes. Uh, and how much does it cost up front? Yeah, a ground source heat pump does have a higher upfront cost. Through our program, we've seen costs range from twenty-five to forty thousand dollars, and that really depends on on the size and complexity of a system. They are, however, a more efficient heating system and can reduce electric heating costs by up to sixty percent for for a customer. So you do see significant benefit from from that heating and cooling option that a ground source heat pump can provide. 
Um, they are ideal for larger lots or open spaces. Um, but you can save, you know, in a, say, a 1,600-square-foot home that's electrically heated, we see about $900 a year in energy cost savings. And they would be eligible for an incentive through Efficiency Manitoba and also the Federal Greener Homes Program. Both of those uh, heat pumps, air source and ground source, are eligible. And if you have a ground source heat pump, uh, obviously you're not needing to supplement it with anything because of the cold. That's going to work year-round. Yeah, a ground source heat pump is still one piece of equipment, and it has an electric backup heater similar to an electric furnace on the coldest days of the year, but but it does operate uh, uh, more more days than the air source heat pump. How much interest are you seeing in uh, people inquiring about heat pumps right now and, uh, you know, the, the need to sort of continue to talk about this? Well, what's your sense of whether or not Manitobans are really leaning into this? Uh, we've, we've seen a steady uptake specifically in air source heat pumps. We've actually, uh, since the program launched in June of 2022, we've seen um, well over 150 installations with many in the queue. Uh, so a lot of interest in that. And ground source heat pumps installations have been steady with approximately 90 uh, since, uh, since 2021. Now, people might want to compare this to uh, electric baseboard heaters. What would you say to people that are, that are looking for a comparison there? So if someone has an electric baseboard heat and you installed air source heat pump, you'd be looking to reduce those annual heating costs by about 30%, which could result in approximately $500 of energy savings from your utility bill a year. How do you suggest people make a choice if they're considering a heat pump? I would say considering um, how efficient your home already is, we always recommend that someone has looked at the insulation and air tightness of their home so that when you do work with a contractor to size your uh, ground source or air source heat pump, you've got a more efficient home and uh, maybe need a little less heat to to, to use. Um, we do have a list of eligible products and qualified contractors on our website, and that would be a great place to start the conversation is visiting efficiencymb.ca. That's Janet Brunel, the Strategic Initiatives Manager at Efficiency Manitoba. We spoke last fall. Now, to learn more about heat pumps and how to get them installed, uh, if it's right for you, you can decide by reading more at efficiencymb.ca, as she mentioned. Now, in tomorrow's budget, we will see what climate action initiatives are included. CBC Sports is your source for sports coverage and insights you won't find anywhere else. Get the athlete's real story on the Player's Own Voice podcast, hosted by Anastasia Buses. Find Player's Own Voice on CBC Listen or wherever you get your podcasts. And whether you're a hardcore fan or just looking to hold your own in the conversation, the Buzzer newsletter helps make you smarter about sports. Subscribe today at cbcsports.ca slash the buzzer. Jarrett Martineau hosts Reclaimed. In an hour, you could hear everything from powwow music to like a soft acoustic ballad to an electronic record to like a dub track all in the same hour from an Indigenous artist from any part of the world. Eclecticism is an overused word, obviously, but I think the sheer diversity that gets represented on the show is something that's totally unique. Reclaimed with Jarrett Martineau. Available now on CBC Listen. Sunny, blue sky in Winnipeg, minus 5. The temperature our high is uh, 5 degrees above. Just looking around the province, uh, Brandon right now is mostly cloudy and minus 6. Thompson's mostly cloudy and minus 10. And uh, Brandon, you're going to go to 3 degrees today. Lots of sunshine for you. Thompson should stay cloudy in a high of just 1 degree. But later in the week, we kind of all come together in this province. By Friday, if this holds, I know, I'm getting ahead of myself. But Friday, sunny, high 13 in Winnipeg. Brandon could see 9 by Friday with sunshine, and same with Thompson, 9 degrees by uh, Friday with sunshine. And then it looks like it could just go up from there, so we will see. Uh, speaking of things coming up this week, we've talked about the budget quite a lot this morning. That's the first NDP budget since they were elected uh, last fall, so we'll see what it holds. But I want to mention some special programming around the budget. Budget day is tomorrow, comes out in the afternoon, and Up to Speed is going to be live at the legislature. So they will be live tomorrow afternoon with their show, getting ready 
reaction, hearing the details at the ledge. Uh, and then the day after, on Wednesday morning, Information Radio is going to be live out in community. So our community studio, as I like to call it, we'd like to pick a busy place in the morning where you can drop by or we'll tap into the people that are there naturally. We're going to be in Bridgewater Forest. So we're going to be at Altia Bridgewater. It's Jim uh, on 100 South Town Road in Bridgewater. So that is Altia Bridgewater, 100 South Town Road in Bridgewater. That's Wednesday morning, Information Radio Live, the day after the budget. So uh, if we don't like it, we can put the finance minister on a treadmill. I'm just kidding. We're not really going to do that. But we do expect we're going to have Adrian Sal on our program and more. So tomorrow, up to speed live at the ledge, and we'll be live in Bridgewater at Altia on Wednesday. In the meantime, if you want to weigh in on what you're hoping for in the budget, we can get your calls on tomorrow morning's show, 788-3205. Your CBC Winnipeg News is next. This is CBC News. Good morning. I'm Heather Wells in Winnipeg at 8.30. Beautiful sunshine out there. It's minus 5 right now in downtown Winnipeg. The sun stays with us through the day. We see a bit of a south wind developing uh, early this afternoon, 20 gusting to 40. Today's high is 5. Well, you may notice gas prices are higher this morning, up slightly more than 3 cents a litre. This is the morning many Canadians start paying more for the price of pollution, the carbon tax imposed on provinces without a carbon pricing plan of their own. But people in those provinces will also see higher paybacks from the Canada carbon rebate. Now, this all comes just one day before Manitoba's provincial budget. A budget Premier Wab Canoe says has many green incentives and will show why Manitoba should be exempt from the carbon tax. In terms of electrifying uh, transportation and converting to, to, to ground source heat pumps for homes and businesses and these other incentives that we're putting into place, Manitoba has a really credible path to net zero and uh, we don't think that the backstop is needed when it comes to that consumer carbon tax. BC, Quebec and the Northwest Territories have their own plans and are not part of the carbon tax or the rebates. Canoe says his government plans to make a case to Ottawa soon. Now, Manitoba RCMP say they are aware of a planned protest to oppose the carbon tax. RCMP say demonstrations are possible on highways near the provincial borders with Ontario and Saskatchewan. As of right now, Manitoba RCMP say everything is normal and highways remain open. Winnipeg police are asking for your help finding a missing four-year-old girl. Sadie Jane Forbes is believed to be with her mother. She and 28-year-old Shasa Forbes were last seen at the McDonald's on Henderson and Fraser's Grove around 3.30 yesterday afternoon. Police believe they have since left the province and are heading west in Saskatchewan. Sadie Jane is described as being 3 feet 6 inches tall, 36 pounds, with brown hair and... Uh, brown eyes and long straight brown hair. She has a small birthmark on her right cheek. Police say they are highly concerned for the little girl's well-being. If you have seen her and her mom, we do have their photos up on our website right now. Or if you have any information about where they are, you're asked to get in touch with police. Nearly 700 of Winnipeg's most vulnerable people will be served Easter lunch today. Salome Mission will host a sit-down holiday meal at their location on Stanley starting at noon today until 2 this afternoon. Dozens of volunteers and staff are preparing and will serve what is one of the downtown shelter's busiest meals of the year. A group of Canadians are banding together to raise awareness about a chronic disease. Lipedema Canada is launching its website today. It provides information and resources for people living with lipedema. That disease causes painful fat buildup and swelling in the arms and legs. Angel Anderson says Manitoba Health refused to cover her lipedema reduction surgeries because they considered them experimental. I get emotional talking about it because it's just like we're so passionate about it. And like I'm so fortunate that I had the resources that I could pay for it before I got to the point of being in a wheelchair because really 
that is, it's a progressive disease and it is going to get just continue to get worse unless something is done. Anderson had to get her surgeries in Germany, costing $90,000. Winnipeg's Muslim community had a busy weekend wrapping gifts for people who need them most. It was the seventh annual toy drive of the Manitoba Islamic Association. The toys will be given to families in need, including those who are new to Canada. Ten-year-old Yusuf Shavan came to the event with her sister and her cousin. I brought a puzzle and a game called uh, Mouse Traps. They brought a puzzle and dolls so I can help people in need have um, gifts for Eid. The donated toys will be distributed by the Canadian Muslim Women's Institute along with some hampers for Eid. Volunteers say they collect hundreds of toys every year during this toy ride. Drive. Well, you may be using it right now. Almost everyone uses it every day. It was 20 years ago Gmail was unveiled to the world. Google's co founders launched the free email service on April 1st, 2004. It offered users one gigabyte of storage for each account. That was at least 250 times more storage than what was being offered by other services. At the time, people thought. Gmail was an April Fool's joke, but users and industry insiders quickly called it a breakthrough. For many, that was the moment they started seeing Google as more than just a search engine. You can find more news updated on our website, cbc.ca slash Manitoba. Literally was just checking it when you said that. There you go. I feel naked. Is that, <laughs> do you know what? So the co-founders <laughs> of Google... It was. Uh, they used to always put out an outlandish April Fool's joke. Mm. And one year, 20 years ago, they said, why don't we just put out this Gmail and look at it now? Mm. Uh, lots of anniversaries in the news today, right? Seems to be, right? Yeah, 25 years in Nunavut, as you're mentioning. All right. Thanks, Heather Wells. Thank you. I'll G-chat you later. It is uh, 8.35 right now. Let's have a final look at the morning commute, uh, which has been, well, pretty quiet, Dylan. Yeah, not much has really changed. Um, haven't heard any updates. So that stall on Lage Modier just past Dougal. Median lane, keep right to pass if it's still there, of course. But yeah, it's been quiet. Pretty good commute. Hopefully it warms up and, you know, you can get outside this week. No, watch Enjoy for the, the kids plus. today. Yeah, yeah, school's in. Other than that, yeah, thank you for the morning. Yeah. Uh, just time enough now to say thank you to everyone who worked on the show this morning. So that is Dylan Longhurst behind the controls. Thank you, Dylan. As well, Brad Lillies. Thank you, Brad. Brad behind the YouTube controls. Thank you to our news center this morning. Uh, Heather Wells, as you've been hearing. And our hardworking team of associate producers, as well as our leaders in unit, Leif Larson, Wendy Parker has been filling in, as well as Nellie Gonzalez. Thank you, everyone who works in the programs. Now, we do not have local programming on today. We've got some network specials for Easter Monday coming up for uh, Radio Noon and up to Speed Spots. So still stay tuned to uh, the radio right here. Also, The Current's coming up next live. And thank you for listening. We are in again tomorrow with Information Radio, and we hope you can join us. I'm Marcy Marcusa, and this is CBC.